My God, what a turnout. Uh, good morning. I'm Rocco Landisman, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's convening around the future of arts participation in America. I'm thrilled that we have more than 40 national service organizations joining us today for a conversation with the NEA's discipline directors around the release of the latest NEA research report, the 2008 Survey of Public Participation in the Arts. I have to say, looking around, that this is an amazing turnout. Uh, it's fantastic that you're all here. Uh, those of us in the theater love to see good box office, and this is about as good as you can get. Um, thank you all for, for uh, considering this important enough to, uh, to come to and, and for turning out. Um, it's going to be a big group, but hopefully we'll, we'll have a good, a good back and forth. Um, as you all know, today's presentation and conversations are also being webcast so that our colleagues and others who are interested in the future of arts participation are able to listen in without having to come to Washington, D.C. I don't want to jump ahead, but one of the not at all surprising findings in our survey uh, is that Americans are increasingly using technology to connect with the arts, some 47 million people last year. And there are more and more ways to use technology, as well as other strategies, to extend and connect with our audience. Helen DeMichel, over here, uh, said that there are new technologies that we can literally hold in our hands that can virtually erase the confines of geography and connect more Americans with more art more often. That is the kind of thinking and response that is the point of the gathering today. Data are neither good nor bad. They are useful only in as much as they inform our work going forward. And that is exactly why Joan Shigakawa gathered all of us today for a conversation that will essentially have two prongs. One, what are the ways that we need to expand and refine this survey going forward? For instance, this is the first year that we've captured data about participation around salsa and Latin music. And we discovered that those audiences tend to be younger and less affluent than the audiences for jazz, opera, and musicals, three of the art forms that we've been tracking since 1982. What else are we missing? The second prong of the conversation will be around how this information should inform our work going forward. When Elizabeth Streb was building her performance space in Brooklyn, she asked whether she wanted to be more like a church um, to which people solemnly came at prescribed times or more like a 7-Eleven to which people can come whenever they want. She opted for the 7-Eleven. Personally, and maybe those in the Midwest will get the reference, I would prefer Steak and Shake, which I got quite a bit of in, uh, in Peoria, but uh, we all have our, pre our, our preferences. Uh, I'm really here today to listen to each of you and to learn uh, what you and your constituents have been doing. So let me turn this meeting over to Joan. Joan, where are you? There you are. Okay. Thank you. I'm looking at Rocco's mic, and it has written on it, Chair. Did you know that you have a no. special mic? I had no idea. I'm going to turn it off now. <laughs> so uh, welcome, everyone. It is, we really appreciate the fact that on one of the busiest times of the year that you were all able to make the journey here and share your insights with us. I, mean, I think we have in front of us a question of whether or not we're at a tipping point. Um, just as information technology democratized access to information across the world. Perhaps technology is helping to democratize access and participation in the arts. So that will be one of our, our major themes of the day, to look at that and kick the tires on that, see if, how we think that that interacts with us and our work. Um, we're going to go quickly around the room <clears throat> because it's so big, no one is going to remember Exactly, and you have your chart, but if you're trying to figure it out, it could take you 15 minutes, who's speaking. So we'll go quickly around the room just to say who we are and what our organization is, so you get a feel of the room. Then we'll come back, and Sunil will do a presentation, quick gloss over the top of the findings, and then we'll have three respondents, and then we're all going to dig down and talk together. So I'm Joan Shigakawa. I'm Senior Deputy Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Helen D. Michelle, Co-Director of the National Alliance for Media Arts and Culture in San Francisco. 
I'm Sunil Iyengar, Director of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, when you speak to the mic, if you could please press the button. <laughs> I'm Linda Downs, uh, Executive Director of the College Art Association. Janet Rice Elman, Executive Director of the Association of Children's Museums. Bob Frankel, Director of Museums and Visual Arts at the NEA. Ron Jones, Dean of the College of, of the Arts at the University of South Florida and because of that, uh, President of the International Council of Fine Arts Deans. I'm Janet Landay. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Art Museum Directors. I'm Maria de Leon, Executive Director of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, NALAC. Sandra Gibson, President and CEO of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, known as APAP. Mario Garcia Durham, Director of Artist Communities and Presenting. National Endowment for the Arts. Andrea Snyder, President and Executive Director of Dance USA and outgoing Chair of the Performing Arts Alliance. I'm Douglas Sontag, the Director of Dance here at the National Endowment for the Arts. Kathy Evans, Executive Director of the National Alliance for Musical Theater. Adam Hutler, Executive Director of Fractured Atlas. Mark Valdez, National Coordinator for the Network of Ensemble Theaters. I'm Jason Lowith, the Executive Director of the National New Play Network. I'm John McAndrews. I'm representing the Shakespeare Theatre Association of America. I'm John Petey, Director of Literature Grants for the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Matt Parisi, the Executive Director of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. I'm Jonathan Katz. I'm CEO of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. We represent and serve the 56 state and jurisdictional arts agencies. I'm Jeffrey Leppendorf, uh, Shared Executive Director of the Council of Literary Magazines and Presses and Small Press Distribution. I'm Randy Cohen, Vice President of Local Arts Advancement at Americans for the Arts. I'm Debbie Landisman, and my organization is wife of the chairman. <laughs> but, um, I also work as a, an advisor with uh, corporate and private foundations. Good morning, Patrice Walker-Powell. I serve as the Deputy Chairman for States, Regions, and Local Arts Agencies here at the Endowment. And I'm Rebecca Blunk, Executive Director of the New England Foundation for the Arts. Susan Chandler, Managing Director of Arts Midwest. Laura Scanlon, Director of States and Regions at the NEA. Adam Bernstein, Deputy Director of Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. Shannon Dowd, Deputy Director, Western States Arts Federation, Westaf in Denver. Jerry Combs, Director of the Southern Arts Federation. Paula Terry, Director of the Accessibility Office here at the Arts Endowment. Good morning, Gay Hanna, National Center for Creative Aging. Lynn Osman, President and CEO of the Chicago Architecture Foundation. Maurice Cox, Director of Design at the National Endowment for the Arts. Good morning, I'm Ron Vogel. I'm President and CEO of the American Architectural Foundation. I'm Julia Lent. I'm Director of Government Affairs at the American Society of Landscape Architects. I'm Barry Burgey, Director of Folk and Traditional Arts at the National Endowment for the Arts. Patty Bowman, Director of Local Learning, the National Network for Folk Arts and Education. I'm Carl Strickwerda. I'm Dean of Arts and Sciences at the College of William and Mary, and I'm representing the Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences, which is National Association of Arts and Sciences Deans. Penny Ojeda, Director of International Activities at the National Endowment for the Arts. Jonathan Herman, Executive Director of the National Guild of Community Schools of the Arts. Good morning, I'm Sandra Rupert. I'm the Director of the Arts Education Partnership. Sarah Cunningham, Director of Arts Education at the NEA. Deborah Hansen, I'm the Education Associate for Visual and Performing Arts at the Delaware Department of Education. And as such, I serve as president of the State Education Agency Directors of Arts Education. Mike Blakesley, I'm Senior Deputy Executive Director of MENC. We're the National Association for Music Education. Amy Fedora, the Director of Government Affairs for Opera America. Ann Meyer Baker, President and CEO of Chorus America. Wayne Brown, Director of Music and Opera, National Endowment for the Arts. Joanne Hubbard Costa, CEO of the American Music Center. Jean Cook, I'm a musician and the Interim Executive Director of Future Music Coalition. Ted Libby, Director of Media Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts. 
Michelle Bird, until last Friday, Executive Director of the Independent Feature Project, a national organization for independent filmmakers. I'm Bill O'Brien, the uh, Deputy Chairman of Grants and Awards here at the NEA. Carlton Turner, Executive Director of Alternate Roots in Atlanta, Georgia. Jesse Rosen, President and CEO of the League of American Orchestras. Um, I forgot to issue a modest warning, which is if your mic is hot, you will be recorded. So if you're going to turn to your neighbor and make a comment, be prepared to make it to the entire World Wide Web <laughs> because we are being recorded. Uh, everything that goes on the mic will be uh, transcribed. Thanks. Okay, Sunil, you, you're up. Thank you, Joan. Uh, I feel like I'm at the League of Superpowers here. <laughs> you know, superheroes or whatever the term is. Um, so um, I'm really pleased to be here today to present to you with the full report of the 2008 Survey of Public Participation in the Arts. Um, those of you at the table have copies of the report, a research brief on ge geographic patterns of arts participation, and um, also on our website, if you care to see it, is a summary uh, document, a brochure of highlights from this report. Um, and for those of you watching by a webcast, you can get that on NEA.gov on the research section. The full report contains eight chapters, including at the very back, a series of one-page summaries. Um, these are rather like tear sheets of the survey's results by art form. Um, and I know there's a lot of data to process, but in the time we have available, I want to review some of the main findings. And I'm, of course, happy to respond to any questions after uh, we get through our respondent uh, section session. Um, as a researcher, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to interact with so many of you in the field where the hard work of generating arts participation really goes on. Um, some of my staff is in the room and I know they feel the same way. So let's begin. I'm going to go fairly quickly through this, but um, as I said, happy to take questions and engage in the discussion afterward. So what is the survey of public participation in the arts? Um, it's really uh, the nation's largest, uh, most nationally representative survey of arts participation trends. And the NEA has designed NEA research staff in consultation with sociologists, statisticians, and uh, survey methodologists has de designed this um, the survey. And we designed it back in 1982, and we've been, you know, periodically updating it. We've conducted it five times in partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau, most recently in 2008. And it was conducted actually in May 2008. And because of the, you know, one of the great things about being a federal agency, I guess, is partnership, partnership possibilities. And so we were able to, uh, you know, use the Census Bureau to help us generate a really high response rate, 82% for a total of more than 18,000 adults interviewed. Um, and one thing about the survey, a key distinction to keep in mind is the rates and the numbers I'll be reporting are based on self-reported behavior patterns, not uh, personal preferences necessarily or attitudes. And those rates of participation are reported over the past 12 months prior to, in this case, May 2008. So the survey respondents are responding about uh, their participation between May 2007 and 2008. Um, and these are the types of activities that we capture uh, through the survey. Art museum or gallery visits, tours of parks or buildings or monuments for design value or historic value, uh, arts and craft fair attendance, and a series of performing arts attendance uh, op uh, opportunities, jazz, classical music, opera, musicals, and non-musicals, ballet, and other dance. And most, most recently in this survey, we added, as the chairman, I think, uh, referred to, uh, two questions, uh, one in particular having to do with Latin music performances, Latin, Spanish, and salsa music. And now we are also tracking outdoor perform performing arts festivals. I'll have more on that later. Um, and also since 1982, we've been tracking literary reading as uh, measured by uh, reading poetry, plays, novels, and short stories. So we do capture other types of arts activities, um, such as taking arts classes or lessons, uh, performing or creating artwork, uh, participating through media. And you can imagine the media question, by the way, has been a bear uh, to struggle with as researchers over the years because the technology is advancing more rapidly sometimes than our ability to accommodate it in the survey. I th I'll explain some of the limitations later. Uh, and non-arts act, uh, leisure activities, uh, such as volunteering, you know, gardening, ex exercising, camping, hiking, canoeing, a whole range of activities, just to understand who are the people who participate in arts events relative to other types of activities. And we do have actually some, a uh, couple of strings of uh, personal uh, preference questions. Uh, so although most of it is behavior, we do ask about genres of uh, music that people like listening to, as well as their favorite types of reading. 
Now, I'm just kind of showing this one slide to cover literature, um, reading of literature here, because we actually reported some of these results earlier in the year. In 2008, for the first time in the survey's history, uh, literary reading, as I described it, actually increased. Uh, currently, uh, more than half of all adults, about 122.8 million Americans, read poems, plays, short stories, or novels, according to the survey. And the reading was actually up for most categories of Americans in regarding uh, different demographic backgrounds, um, and particularly for young adults who showed the steepest increase in, uh, in reading rates, which was uh, nice to see given the previous uh, trend of long-term decline. Now, um, I'm just going to talk to you brief. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. And again, I'll try to move fairly rapidly through this. But the first item is arts attendance. Uh, then I'll be talking about performing or creating artwork, uh, media participation, and finally, state and regional patterns of participation. So what you're looking at here is the number of US adults attending an arts event at least once in the past 12 months. Uh, and again, the survey was taken in May 2008. And on the left side, I hope you can see it, are a range of uh, categories, types of activities that we track attendance for. And the first one is actually, I refer to this as historic sites, but the question actually is asking people if they attended a park, if they visited a park, monument, or building, or toured it for historic or design value. Um, then you have arts, craft, fair, festivals, um, museums, and galleries. And you see that the first three or four bars, you know, obviously are, uh, you know, claim larger numbers, sheer numbers of millions of adults uh, participating. Um, whereas at the bottom, and then you see it goes through the performing arts, various categories, finally to uh, ballet and opera at the bottom there. Uh, now this is just obviously the number of adults participating, and so for the purpose of trend analysis, what we like to do to account for population growth is look at percentages. So that, those will primarily be the measure I'll be talking about. So arts attendance, um, between 1982 and 08, I guess if you wanted one number to kind of take away, uh, it's that 35% of all adults in 2008, uh, roughly 78 million Americans, attended an art museum or an arts performance in the 2008 survey period. Now, there are only certain art forms that we've been able to track definitively since 82, and these are jazz, classical music, opera, musical plays, non-musical plays, ballet, and art museums. So this is what we're talking about when we say, or an arts performance, uh, or museums, in, and museums includes art galleries. Now, in contrast, uh, nearly 40%, between 39 and 40%, in 82, 92, and 2002 reported going to one of these activities. Uh, five, so an aggregate of five percentage point drop. And what that translates into is, by art form, we're seeing proportionately fewer adults attend particularly arts performances. Um, if you look at the bottom, actually, uh, just to look at a few of these uh, in a row, um, classical music, uh, non-musical plays, and ballet have seen a long-term uh, decline either from 92 or from 82 um, in terms of percentage attending. Um, if you look at, um, there, there are some exceptions here. Uh, musical plays, in fact, um, declined uh, from 82, but in fact is, 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 is still on par with uh, the 2002 level. That is not a statistically significant difference between 02 and 08 in the case of uh, musical plays. Um, and then if you look at um, opera and jazz, what you see is for the first time in the survey, they actually took, there was a dip in participants. Um, we saw in the case of jazz, the, the dip was so severe that it's actually now the percentage is participating is lower than what was in, back in 82. And in the case of opera, um, you know, it's starting out in that case with a small base percentage in the first place. So what, you're, what that translates into is about a third of its share of, of the U.S. population is now participating uh, compared to O2. Um, and I neglected to mention art museums, which of course isn't in, in the arts performance category. Uh, there what you've seen is um, sort of similar to musical plays. You see that there isn't a pattern of a consistent long-term decline, but you do see um, that, it's, it, that this number now, 23% in 08, is actually on par with the 22% in 82. It's not statistically significant, uh, but it did grow between uh, 82 and 02. So now it's kind of come back to the 82 level. Um, and I think there are two things I just want to kind of emphasize here. One is we also looked at the number, sheer number of times people attended events. And one uh, important observation is that for most of these activities, the average number of times people who did attend went to arts activities didn't change. 
Uh, in other words, we're led to believe that for most of these, these drops, it's, it's actually sheer numbers of people not attending, and actually that's the makes up the true decline, rather, you know, lack of people going rather than people going fewer times. Um, the other um, point is, of course, uh, as we were, and this was on our mind, believe me, when we were crunching the numbers, is O2, you know, of course, this is an anomalous situation with the economy. Uh, the recession hit, uh, you know, it had been undeclared, but it was, you know, active uh, when the survey was taking place. So we do wonder how much of this is attributable to that. Uh, so we did examine consumer spending patterns and gas prices and factors that might contribute to declines in attendance. Uh, but there are two reasons why we believe perhaps this is a longer term situation of a decline in many of these art forms rather than dependent solely on the economic conditions. One is uh, the long term trends here which suggest fundamental shifts in the relationship between age and arts attendance. Some of you have seen this material, I've actually shared this with some of you, um, and it shows here the median age of arts attendees. Um, the top, just look at the first row, if you will, and you're seeing for every year of the survey, except 85, which is comparable with the other years, uh, I'm sorry, comparable with 82, you see that uh, the average age uh, was 39 and 82, now it's, uh, it's 45, and that aging is largely reflective of the baby boomer presence in the population. Um, but when you look at these, some of these art forms, jazz, classical music, non-musical plays, and ballet, you see that they've aged more rapidly than the general population of adults. Um, and that's something, of course, that I know that I've heard from the field, too, as sort of anecdotally. So um, here are some of those numbers. Um, and there are two factors here to kind of keep in mind, which I'm not showing you, which is in, 80, in 88, uh, sorry, in 08, for the first time, we saw um, 45 to 54-year-olds uh, drop in attendance for many art forms. And that may, may indeed be a, you know, linked with the economic situation, because that, might, that may be a, an aberration we don't know. Uh, but uh, when you look at y young people, 18 to 24, 18 to 34, uh, we do see consistent patterns of decline in attendance from many of these kinds of art forms. Um, and, uh, and one of the things you, know, you, you might ask is what are they actually doing? What are 18 to 24 is doing that we capture? Well, uh, we do know they volunteer at very high rates relative to other age groups, um, and their volunteering rates have increased. Um, in terms of art, as you'll see, they, they create uh, they perform, they do activities online, uh, and those are some of the activities we captured. And as you saw before, they showed some of the, this time around, they showed some of the sharpest growth in reading, literary reading. The second factor that leads us to believe this is more of a long-term uh, pr uh, trend of decline is even the most educated Americans now are participating less than before. This is uh, an example from ballet where you see um, there has been, a, there was a decline between 82 and 02, but then it kind of dropped off further uh, this time around in 08, and um, so from roughly 11% to I believe it's seven, 6 or 7% of all adults participating, college educated adults, sorry, participating. Why is that so? Well, one of the things you might look at is understanding how adults have been exposed to arts education and arts lessons, sort of the, the uh, tools that kind of whet their appetite in terms of participating in many of these kinds of events described. So uh, we looked at waves of each survey 18 to 24 year olds and the, the rate at which they reported having arts education in their lives. And what you see here is for various art forms on the left, uh, music lessons or classes, visual arts classes, creative writing, uh, art appreciation courses, music appreciation and acting, you see declines in the percentages of 18 to 24 year olds in, in 2008 versus the 18 to 24 year olds in 82. Um, so fewer percent, proportionally, uh, 18, 24 year olds now say they've had exposure to these opportunities or that they've taken advantage of that exposure. Um, in the case of music, it's about, I believe, uh, dropped by a third, uh, that share, and uh, for visual arts, uh, it's about half what it was in 82. Now, this is wrapping up the attendance section. I want to just kind of give you an overview. Of, I've talked about rates respective to certain types of segments of the population, but now I want to show you what is your average, what does an arts audience look like when you break out, when you go in and look at the audiences for each of these kinds of categories. Well, for each activity measured, uh, with some exceptions, which I'll mention, uh, more than half of the audience is one of these, uh, 45 years or older, a college graduate or higher, or earning uh, $75,000 uh, a year or more. And the exceptions here are, uh, we find for Latin music audiences, outdoor performing arts festivals audiences, audiences for arts craft festivals, and parks and historic sites or uh, neighborhoods, touring neighborhoods for design or historic value, 
it's hard to kind of get that off gracefully. But, um, and uh, those are exceptions to these three uh, criteria, if you want to call it. Um, the third, the, I'm putting down jazz concerts and art museums because while they, don't, they aren't exceptions in every case, you do see that for jazz concerts, for example, uh, while you see relatively high educa highly educated people taking part in those activities, uh, their incomes are generally lower than, than other participants, and it's closer to that of the general population. Art museums, you see um, younger audiences than uh, you do for some of these other types of arts categories. Now, uh, moving to performing or creating artwork. Um, Photography and filmmaking uh, really kind of took off. It's increase, increased since 1992. It's actually the only form we've tracked of arts creation or performance where, where we have long-term trend data and we've seen an increase. And 92 is the first year we started measuring this stuff uh, in terms of creation and performing. Uh, so it's now 15% of all adults. I think it's kind of a no-brainer, but we're looking into it, of course. Uh, what's the reason for this? I mean, ob obviously the advent of digital media, uh, more affordable opportunities, uh, to sh and this, this is a category that includes videography and filmmaking as well as photography, as it says. Um, classical music performance, uh, in terms of the percentage of people say they perform or rehearse classical music, has increased since 02, although it's fallen from the last time at 92. Uh, and we're seeing uh, stable levels of participation for painting, drawing, sculpture, creative writing, and jazz performance. And finally, um, a little worrisome is some of these categories, dancing, weaving, sewing, which includes quilting, needlework, and uh, pottery and ceramics, which includes leatherwork and metalwork and jewelry making, uh, have seen long-term declines. And here's what you see from, uh, it's rather an intimidating uh, table there, but it's in your, it's in your uh, report. But just to understand this, this is the percentage of the U.S. population that's adult population that performs or creates art by these years and the changes in terms of percentage point drops or gains over that period. And the only thing I'd like to point out, a couple things. One is weaving and sewing traditionally had been the most popular activity in the last uh, two survey waves. And this time around, it's supplanted by photography, but it still claims like the sec second most, uh, has the second highest percentage of participants. Um, the other thing I want to point out is there are things that are not in this table that are very interesting and I'm, I'm nowhere we're going to have interesting discussion hopefully about is the fact that young adults actually participate at higher rates than other age groups in many of these art forms. Um, and, uh, and that's something significant. Also, there's again more representation closer to the general population when you look at some of these other things. Um, when you look at choir and chorus singing, uh, African Americans actually make up the largest group of, of uh, that uh, participants. Um, when you look at um, jazz, you see that actually uh, men, males, this is the only category for which males are actually participate more in terms of creating and performing than women. It's about 72% of men, uh, sorry, 72% of jazz creator, uh, players uh, or creators are uh, in fact men. So um, let's just go over to media participation. Now, this is such a daunting kind of category. It's basically, br so I need to kind of redo the survey question because uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion. Uh, basically, we've been, since 82, we've been tracking broadcasts and recordings as well as live participation, but obviously that's changed now with the new media. We've tried to incorporate it, so we've done it in, one of, in two ways. This way is we, ca we still capture the standard broadcast or recordings question, but we also include online media. So the question actually is, during the last 12 months, did you watch or listen to any recorded or live broadcasted arts performances on your TV, radio, or computer, including watching or listening on portable media devices such as an iPod, cell phone, or portable DVD player? Now, we do that for every art form. Uh, and actually, the results are not surprising. Um, they're actually in line with what we saw before the new media, if you will. Uh, more Americans engage with performances this way than actually attend live arts events. Only live theater still attracts more audiences than broadcasts or recordings. That's for you, Rocco. Yeah. And, uh, but really, if you look at this, this table here, what you see is uh, basically the percentage of the millions. And another interesting th thing to note is, again, we added Latin and salsa music. Well, guess what? For the first time, it's actually, that category actually claims the most number of people than any of the other performing arts categories, um, which is really, again, telling us what else you know, what, what might be out there that we need to talk about in terms of uh, this next survey. Um, but, um, li you know, also uh, you see that, um, as I said, I explained about theater, that's actually roughly, uh, it, it's, not, it's not more than the, the sheer number of live audience members. Okay. 
Then we, of course, we drilled down into online activities specifically. So we did ask uh, people if they use the internet and then what did they use it for in terms of arts activities. And we found that uh, close to 40% of all internet using adults, about 62 million Americans viewed, listened to, downloaded, or posted artworks or performances and that they viewed, listened to, or downloaded music, theater, or dance performances, or visual artworks at least once a week. Um, and again, it, this gives us an, a window into something we have not been capturing. I mean, the sheer frequency of participation in this sense uh, relative to when we ask somebody how many times did you physically go to an event. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity here and more data, of course, to mine. Finally, I'm just going to... Um, talk about the, um, the state and regional patterns just a little bit. I have to thank uh, Bonnie Nichols, who's in the audience, for doing a really fine analysis, which is in your uh, materials on state and regional patterns. Um, so arts attendance. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is our temptation is we want to rank these regions and states and say, what are the top 10 in this category or that category? Unfortunately, we can't do that because the sample sizes for some of these areas are so small. While we can report reliable percentage points, we can't say that one is definitively more, has a strong, higher participation rate necessarily than another, although that we can say which are leading the pack, as it were. Uh, so what this is telling you is that the Pacific and New England regions, uh, pr they lead in performing arts and art museum galleries, uh, among other regions. And mid-Atlantic region uh, actually stands out in terms of musical play attendance. Uh, the mountain region, region uh, actually is, is shares this with the Pacific in that it has very high rates of Latin music performance, um, attending, sorry, Latin music performances, and attendance also for outdoor performing arts festivals is high for the mountain states. Uh, and the west, north, central region actually shows, you know, high rates of attending or visiting parks or historic sites. For creating and performing art, we see that, um, again, uh, something similar with Pacific and New England, high, strong rates of participation there. But here we see a couple things we didn't, uh, we didn't necessarily know we'd capture. East, South, Central leading in choral or choir singing, and West, South, Cent North, Central playing in musical instruments. Now I can translate this. It's in the report which states line up with these categories. Um, but we saw a similar thing with states. Uh, Oregon really was far and away with a couple of other states in performing arts attendance in general. Uh, we see uh, attendance also strong in that area by Cal with California, but particularly for Latin music. Maryland and Washington State, art museums and galleries, Connecticut, Minnesota, and New York, uh, musical plays, Massachusetts, ballet, and other dance forms. And for creating and performing art, it's interesting, the Plains states of Nebraska and Kansas actually have some of the strongest rates in terms of creative writing and painting and drawing. Um, for choral and choir singing, uh, as we said with the regions, we see Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, very strong here. And with pottery, ceramics, remember that's a pretty expansive category, includes jewelry work and leather work and metal work. Uh, Wyoming and sewing and weaving, which includes tapestry and, you know, uh, uh, quilting and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's very interesting to kind of see that spread here. And one major <laughs> caveat I forgot to mention up front is, again, the small sample sizes, but that also means we can only re report, reliably report rates for 32 states. So there's so much more we're, we're technically missing. Nevertheless, um, we came up with this map, and um, you don't have to worry about <laughs> figuring out what the colors mean or what the numbers mean right now. I'm just telling you it's in your materials. But what we try to do is a correlation analysis of high concentration of attendance to performing arts events and align that with where the performing arts organizations are. And while there are a couple of predictable findings in that, yes, the states with the most high per capita concentration of performing arts organizations also show high rates of performance, attending performances, there are some states where there are, few, there are much, much less in terms of much fewer numbers of performing arts centers in their states, and yet there are relatively high rates of participation. Some of those plain states, for example, in Oregon with a 41% rate of participation versus uh, and if you look at the U.S. performing arts attendance rate overall, it's 29%. What does that tell us? Well, one of the things it tells us is that there could be other venues that people are getting, deriving arts enjoyment and participation from. Uh, we did, fortunately, this time around, ask some questions, and this is my penultimate slide, I believe. Uh, we did ask some questions about um, participating in elementary schools, middle schools, or high schools of adults, because for most of the performing arts questions I've named, we've, only asked, we've, we've asked them to exclude school activity. So here we find that, you know, one in four adults actually attends, maybe with their kids, uh, performances at these venues. 
We also find that a third of all parents said that their child had attended a music theater or dance performance outside school in the last year. And we found that uh, one in five adults reported attending a live arts performance at a place of worship. So I think this again presents more opportunities to think about w what, 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 ask, what ingredients in a community truly engage the public in the arts. So the conclusions. Um, I know you've had to listen to a lot from me and I, I'm just trying to distill three main points that I think we can safely conclude. One is arts participation measured by live attendance has declined for most art forms since 1982 and 2002, with the exceptions I noted, musical plays, art museums, and literary reading. Secondly, uh, the new questions about Latin music, festival attendance, and digital media reflect different groups of Americans participating that we have not necessarily captured through our statistics before with some of the traditional, the other art forms. And finally, um, unique geographic and demographic traits linked with high participation could prove key, could be an opportunity for understanding and improving access. So as part of that process, we in the research office are studying uh, factors such as um, arts. Uh, I mentioned the geography in terms of states and regions. We're also looking at urban and rural areas, um, how age is related to arts participation more in depth, race and ethnicity, media and technology, and creating and performing art where we have some new questions. So, so these, this is really um, an opportunity, I hope, to kind of find out um, where, what are some of the pressure points, you know, geographically and demographically to kind of raise the overall rates of arts participation. Thank you very much. I, I just want to thank Kelly Rogowski for helping me with assisting with the presentation and then Bonnie Nichols for her fine analysis. Thanks. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you very much. So now we're going to have initial responses from the field and we're going to start with Carlton Turner, Director of Alternate Routes. Carlton, go. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Landsman and Deputy, Senior Ch Deputy <laughs> Chairman Shigakawa. <laughs> the amazing staff of the NEA this is indeed an honor and a great opportunity to be here. Um, Bessie Smith sprang from the banks of the Tennessee River singing sultry southern blues. Thomas Williams, born in thick Mississippi mud, moved to New Orleans to write about depression and love and changed his name to Tennessee. Ray Charles, son of a sharecropper, got his master's degree in boogie-woogie piano at Mr. Wiley Pitt's Red Wing Cafe. Muddy Waters and Robert Johnson walked the crossroads to break new ground for B.B. King and Elvis Presley to build superhighways to go supernova. Kenny Chesney and Dolly Parton learned the meaning of mountain music through the worn strings of Doc Boggs, banjo playing Saturday night honky-tonks into Sunday morning church chants with Ralph Stanley crooning Man of Constant Sorrow beneath the preacher's pulpit. Louis Armstrong saw through the ignorance of segregation to sing to the masses of the wonderful world that lurked just on the other side of humanity. Eudora Welty, Aretha Franklin, Richard Wright, Alex Haley, Alan Toussaint, and the entire Marsalis family. The list goes on and on and on. Most, if not all, of these names are recognized as artistic visionaries in their discipline, geniuses, if you will. These unique and, in some cases, exotic flowers were all plucked from the fertile southern soil. On the regular and often without occasion, these artists are celebrated for their commitment to setting the artistic standards by which all others are, are measured. This level of artistic mastery could not exist without the support of a rich ecosystem of community that includes a host of nutrients that contribute to the development of such talent. Who's to say that before fortune, any one of these greats might have been replaced by someone equally as talented? Perhaps the ecosystem itself is what our cultural policy should be celebrating. The SPPA attempts through this survey to measure a vast and extremely diverse nation by looking at participation in and attendance at benchmark art forms, classical music, musical plays, ballet and other dance, art, craft fairs, performance festivals, etc. Implicitly, it says that this is an approximate measure of our nation's artistic health, or not. I would like to make the case that the premise of this survey is flawed, flawed because its frame attempts to use the benchmark arts as the norm by which the entire country's participation is measured. According to the survey, the West-South Central region comprised of Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana demonstrates low participation in reading literature, attending classical music, opera, and arts craft fairs. Well, that is dismaying from one point of view. However, if you shift your perspective and look at the contributions of artists from just one small corner of that rather large landmass, New Orleans, it illuminates something completely hidden from view. 
America's acknowledged homegrown indigenous music, jazz, was born in New Orleans. In spite of attempts to prematurely pronounce New Orleans dead, the music still lives and breathes and is as integral to the life of the city as the air and the water that surrounds it. Citizens of New Orleans may not listen to or play a lot of classical Western European music, but they sure play a lot of American classical music. They may not attend or perform a great deal of opera, but New Orleans is a city with a hugely operatic life force, including tragedy on a grand scale. Of course, I'm speaking of the tragedy that played out before a national audience in late August 2005. Much more than just a parade, one can even argue that Mardi Gras is an extremely popular form of contemporary theater. What makes the culture of New Orleans so great is that the citizens of New Orleans own it. Their sense of ownership supersedes education or economic background. So when you feel ownership over something, it changes you from a consumer to an active participant. Once I began to view the survey from the point of view of indigenous art and artists, things began to change. According to the survey, the East-South Central region demonstrates low participation in attending benchmark activities including jazz, Latin music, performing arts festivals, and historic sites. And some of that makes sense. Historical sites in the East Coast are shrines to America's founding, to the first American Revolution. Historical sites in the South are shrines to the second American Revolution, the Civil War. And much like the war itself, speak to conflicting values in a dark, bloody period in our history one that continued until legal segregation was ended merely 60 years ago. All these effects are still visible across the southern landscape. Attendance at such historical sites may be well low, for a tour of an antebellum plantation or Civil War battlefield has very different resonance and meaning depending on which side of the north-south, black-white divide one lives. Another example, attendance at jazz performances may be low in Appalachia, but Appalachia wasn't the birthplace of jazz. Its music represents a different experience geography and history. Listen to Ralph Stanley, Bill Monroe, or Patsy Cline. The survey supports the idea that formal education plays a role in participation in the benchmark arts. And the South as a whole has less formal education than either the Pacific or New England regions, which top most of the survey's list. So is there a class bias embedded into this survey? For certainly education and economic class correlate. Critical to the rich ecosystem that has nurtured greatness is a traditional and community-based art sector. It is diverse and large, volunteer and unincorporated. How does the survey capture this part of the ecosystem? So in order for this survey to be useful, the NEA must find a way to count the opera as well as the church choir, poet laureates as well as spoken slam poets, ballerinas and b-boys, chamber musicians and mountain string bands, there must be an acknowledgement of how the everyday person encounters and engages with the arts. More than any quantifiable measure of excellence, it is the chance to participate that the public most values. Participation is the recipe for excellence, and excellence is relevant. Southern artists today still believe and understand that place is important. The important question is how agencies such as the NEA can aid more artistic expression and further exploration of work that is rooted in place the people in unique and specific cultures. There is no homogenous America, but there are numerous many Americas, all of them eager to create art that speaks to their existence and helps to define their reality. How can we be of service? Thank you, Carl. Okay, next we hear from Jesse Rosen, President and CEO of the League of American Orchestras. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Rocco, and everyone from the NEA. Uh, it, I think it's terrific that the agency has brought us together to look at this report. We know um, of the NEA principally as a grants-making agency, and I think it is a, a tremendous contribution that it devotes resource to helping us understand our environment with a fact-based uh, report such as this. I also want to thank the agency for putting me around the table with colleagues like Carlton and listening to his remarks remind me of how totally differently uh, so many of us look at our landscape and our worlds and our arts and I'm just glad to be in a room full of all of that difference of view and perspective. I think the conversation we're having today is exactly uh, the right conversation at the right time, understanding age and size of audience, how it's changing, is absolutely essential as our organizations evolve today. I also want to offer just some thanks for speaking 
uh, from the 2,000 orchestras in America in communities large and small and give some indication as to how we look at this information. There are three very critical observations I'd like to make. The first is that we believe these findings are credible. The second is we think that this is not just an issue about the arts, that something very, very big is changing in American culture and in American life. And then finally, we think it's clear that the public is defining participation in new ways and orchestras are committed to serving more Americans with music in the places and forms that the public wants it. Let me just briefly explain what I mean by each of these three points. We think the findings are credible because the League's own independent research corroborates these trends for orchestras. We've looked at our own data as well as other consumer survey data and confirmed the trend lines in the SPPA and we've drilled deeper into the behavior of different age cohorts. Second, the declines that the SPPA data reveal across many sectors, film, sports, gardening, outdoor activities, to name a few, clearly show that this issue affects more of our culture than just the arts. Something is changing in the way Americans participate in just about all live activity. The data, though, is descriptive of what is happening. It does not answer the question of why these changes are taking place. There's a great opportunity here for further research to illuminate and help us understand, really, why is this happening, not just what is happening. The orchestra field, and I'm sure many of us would welcome greater understanding and greater research in those areas. On the third point, there are two findings that give us in the orchestra community optimism. The fact that the fact that 40 million people view or listen to classical music electronically or online, and that there is an increase in classical music performance in the home in the last six years, suggests we have great opportunities for serving even more Americans with classical music in the concert hall and elsewhere. Orchestras have not just woken up to these trends, they have already begun to test strategies to meet the public's new preferences for engagement. Orchestras are experimenting with concert, the concert experience itself, with ticket pricing, with creating communities online, and with greater access to electronic media. To illustrate, I'll just cite one example of a kind of innovation taking place in orchestras today, and this is a project with the Memphis Symphony. It's called uh, Leading from Every Chair. And the Memphis Symphony found itself in a situation with a decreased demand for their live performances, and what they wanted to do was to figure out, well, okay, maybe we need to deploy our musicians in different kinds of ways. And so the Memphis Symphony went to FedEx, the largest employer in the Memphis area, and their, their manager would not be happy if I tell the story as he told it to me, but I'll tell it anyway because it's kind of cute. The, the, the symphony people went to FedEx and said, you know, we're the orchestra and you're FedEx and we should be doing something together. And FedEx said to them, well, yeah, right, we're FedEx, you're an orchestra, what, what could we possibly be doing together? And somebody said, well, we don't really know, but we wanted to start the conversation. Well, FedEx said, well, come back when you figure something out. So the symphony people worked on this, they went back to FedEx, and they said, we have an idea. We think that the act of ensemble performance speaks worlds about what it means to collaborate, to mediate, to move toward a common goal, and we think we're actually pretty good at it. And FedEx said, hmm, those are qualities and attributes that are really meaningful to us in our work. Let's see if we can find some way that what you know about solving problems together through ensemble performance can help. How, how can that help us in the work we do? And so Memphis Symphony musicians now are involved with the HR department and in training of supervisors and staff at FedEx in how to work collaboratively together. Orchestras do have a long way to go. But at the League, we take the view that orchestras have to engage with the SPPA findings. We've disseminated them widely to our members, and we'll continue to create the forums for discussion and exchange and help establish the next practices that will result in greater service to the American public. Thank you. Uh, Joan, 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 um, sorry, I need to, since we are on tape, I need to correct a statement I made. Uh, because basically, um, as Jesse points out, the number of people who participated in classical music through electronic media was actually 40 million, which is greater than even for Latin salsa. But Latin salsa was the point I'd made earlier is, was the second most uh, popular that way. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. And our last respondent is Helen De Michelle, co-director of the National Alliance of Media Arts and Culture. 
Helen. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Landisman, Senior Deputy Chairman Shigagawa. The research and program staff are inviting me here as a representative of the media arts. I'm honored to be here to respond on behalf of all media makers grappling with these issues. Um, I think that I was asked to prepare comments because we serve the independent, highly diverse, nonprofit media arts field, a sector that while it has no presence in the survey, probably holds an important key to answering many of the vexing findings and offer possibly new and innovative models to move forward. Because my time is brief, I'll offer a few headline thoughts from a media maker's perspective and a few recommendations to keep this dialogue going forward. First, I want to um, mention our organization and how we position ourselves in the cultural ecology. It's kind of important. Maybe we can pull up the, the atomic slide. Um, For us at NAMAC, um, creativity and connectivity are intertwined and define the emerging wave of cultural participation. Media, both as an art form, film, video, installation, and digital hybrids, and also as a pipeline for delivery, is tightly woven into the fabric of our cultural life, and we need to honor it and use it well and wisely for the public good. In our hyper-commercialized media sphere, it can be confusing to understand how important public media is. More than ever, it's like creating a land trust in national parks, an environment for everyone, from our neighborhoods to our homes and into our hands with devices. As you can see from our graphic here, uh, we pivot in our organization between two worlds of creativity and connectivity. Uh, creativity, which is a very intense, as we know from the survey, dynamic world of activity right now, especially as it concerns film and the digital landscape. Our media and arts organizations are, like yours, the support system that fosters this creativity. And we also deal with cultural policy, which is why I'm here today. Then we turn and we shuttle over to engage with the communications revolution, which is now happening in public media, telecom policy, and in technology. This is about the power and use of connectivity and how we can protect and steward it, much like public lands, on behalf of the American people. We position ourselves to understand how these two worlds interconnect. We conduct research, we bring together thought leaders, we train uh, next generation leaders, and we advocate on behalf of the media arts as a powerful expressive form that has to be integral to our cultural communities. So for everyone, we are your friends and collaborators, not your competitors. Um, I'm not sure if film audiences have really declined because it wasn't really captured in the data in this particular survey. I'd like to look at the findings of the report and just give you a few thoughts that we're thinking about in our field. That I think I echo what you said as well, that culture reflects one part of a massive social transformation that we're undergoing right now and that technological innovation and disruption are a central part of our field and the larger world of communications that we live in. For example, the media arts are by nature stationed at the edge of experimentation and adaptability. Often, new players in the arts start with their interest in media. They may start in media, in community media centers, in youth media programs, local centers that are funded by the endowment, or attend film exhibitions and festivals that are also funded by the NEA. And like theater, we move back and forth between the public, nonprofit work, and commercial media. The boundaries are permeable, especially now for young people. Can the survey capture the forces now sweeping away legacy ways of thinking about culture? How are we to measure these shifting relationships in the hyperlocal and simultaneously globally connected sphere that we're all operating in? For us, the 2008 report signals that as we've heard before here, traditional arts venues are in fierce competition with overwhelming popular culture options, especially in terms of cost. There are more de de demands on a family's time, and people are simply working more with less time available for going out to traditional high art and classical venues. And again, we think cost is a factor here. New technologies are absorbing free time, that is, taking up time to learn them, get up on the learning curve, and use them. A lack, obviously, of classical arts education in the schools is showing up in the 18 to 24 demographic. 
and the notion, and I find this very interesting, um, that many people are grappling with now is the new generation of amateurs are redefining what arts participation means. And I'm not using it in a pejorative sense, but we see the resurgence of craft activities, the huge popularity of the Maker's Fair, ethnic and identity related arts experiences, and DIY culture that lives totally outside traditional institutions using social media now to create community and culture. In fact, um, some, uh, Shannon Dahls here uh, talks about in um, work that she's doing about the experience community which is emerging. Um, which she identifies as what new arts participants want. Hyperconnectivity with food, drink, and event, and all kinds of dialogue that goes above and beyond what the arts event offers. Um, what is that all about? So we see these forces, among many others, are demanding us, as we heard before from our other respondents, new ways of thinking, talking, and working together across disciplines and barriers that can redefine community and participation, and I would say especially across generations. In our 2004 report, Deep Focus, which was looking at the future of independent media and funded by Joan, we predicted that uh, there would be an, a massive explosion of online media and how it would be a game changer by the end of the decade, demanding new types of collaboration and co-creation strategies. But most importantly, during that period of time, it was not only focused on technological change. At the same time, what we started to do was look at, with our colleagues across the media arts, what would be a set of values that could ground our work as media makers in this very explosive environment, and how could organizational leaders deal with this time of transformation. So, to make the uh, survey, the next survey, more meaningful and capture some of these emerging cultural realities impacting traditional arts venues and audiences, I offer some quick recommendations and my explanations can come later because I don't have that much time. Um, we can, before the next survey iteration, I, I think that the endowment can use us as national organizations to convene across the country facilitated dialogues about creating new models. We can develop together a process to welcome and invite these new participants and new players to these gatherings, expose them to our ideas, get their ideas collected in collaborative face-to-face -face gatherings because they are there. They are excited and passionate about the interface between art, community, and technology, and then use what the Internet does best, bring people together who are usually not part of these conversations to share through the web environment social media and new media in ways to expand and further an open and, and transparent dialogue process that can be captured again and reported on. Now this is a new populist and participatory way of coming up with solutions prior to the next survey iteration. We use new processes with new participants experiment with new media to get the thinking out there and find collaborative openings so we can trigger an explosion of innovation around reconnecting people with culture and um, social issues, I would say. So in conclusion, um, our thoughts are that because the barriers are crumbling and shifting dimensions as we speak, we have a rare opportunity now to work together, collaborate and co-create using the tools of media both as a platform for both expression as an art form in and of itself and as a communications network of connectivity. As the survey indicates, people are getting their art through electronic and digital means. What can we find out about that and why? And what does that say also about the use of media as an art form in and of itself, not just as a pipeline? We think in many ways that was a battle fought probably 100 years ago, but apparently the issue goes on. So we need to also make sure that a public, non-corporate controlled media space is protected because we are, like it or not, in the process of redefining what an arts experience is in terms of geography, discipline, and ethnicity. And this space is where the innovation is developing. And we have to harness the potential of how both people as individuals and communities relate through culture to these spaces. How do our legacy arts interface with a handheld device? So I will ask, 
How is the NEA going to respond to the requirements of social media and its implications developing daily for transformation across the arts? And how are we going to welcome new participants into this space and listen to what they have to offer, create, and communicate? Well, we asked for challenges, and we have them <laughs> from our respondents. So thank you all three very much. Uh, there are a lot of us around the table, and we put our heads together to try to figure out how we could feel the questions. And so what we're going to ask you to do, if you wish to speak, is to take your table tag and put it up on end. Uh, Nicole and Carolyn will try to keep track of uh, the order in which people have asked to speak. Uh, and we'll flag it for us here at the top of the table. Um, and uh, we'll sort of crisscross the room because you're, you're grouped by disciplines. So uh, we'll kind of hop around the room as we go. So is before uh, we have a few minutes before we break for lunch. So we'd love to hear from anyone who'd like to make a comment. And if Yes, please. Question for, um, oh, uh, let me ask you to identify yourselves because the table is so big. Uh, Carl Strickwerda, um, representing the Co Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences. This is in part a question, first of all, about the statistical um, part of the survey, but it arises in a way out of uh, Helen's remarks, and that is I mean, what she's raising in part is a question of saying if people are doing new media, are these people who are already as I see on my campus, uh, students who are into dance and music and so on, and they're very active in new media, okay? They're putting up videos, they're doing all kinds of stuff on websites. Uh, that doesn't necessarily increase the percentage of people doing art. It just means we're getting more, but it's somewhat from the same people. Or are new media capturing, uh, it's a little bit like Carl's point, are, are, are there forms of media out there that are not captured by the kind of indicators that we already have? So. One way to begin that question is to ask you, do you do cross tabulations? So are people who are doing a lot of opera doing a lot of jazz? The people who are going to art museums, are they also active in uh, choirs and so forth? So you know, in that sense, are we talking about a segmented population that has, you know, they're into um, you know, uh, producing you know, plastic arts and they don't do music right. and so forth and so on? Or are we talking about a lot of, uh, uh, cross-participation among different kinds right. of media. And that's an excellent question. We are actually now uh, in the process of finishing up a report on cross, that cross-tabulation of people who participate in some of these other art forms and who engage in media it, it, to uh, experience art. So we will hope to have a sense of what is the overlap exactly among what types of demographic groups. The reason it is so complex is rather than just report out a number on this is the number for this particular art form, we want to go by each demographic, other ver demographic variable, and really get a very robust kind of report out of that. Um, so we are looking into this. I can tell you though that for the electronic media question that I, you know, that long question I read out, um, for most of these arts activities, the profile of the audiences are si very similar to that of these live attendance events. So it's not necessarily that younger people necessarily are going, uh, are, are, are experiencing. Uh, you know, broadcasts or recordings of some of these art forms at, at higher rates than they do attend arts events. But when you get to creating and performing stuff online and using, when you single out internet use and handheld, you know, d device, you know, digital media use, we actually find, uh, you know, strong rates, relatively strong rates among young adults versus these other age groups. But we are still looking into that. Thank you. Okay, who's my next? Patty Bauman, Local Learning. Uh, the paradox of high tech and low tech fascinates me as a folklorist and uh, the, the folkloric nature of YouTube, for example. And I'd like to offer the field of folklore and our state art, uh, folk arts coordinators, but also academics to help understand um, and get to the places where young people, recent immigrants, all kinds of people are interacting with new media with traditional art forms, and um, these pockets of people who 
wouldn't respond to, yes, I go to an arts performance, and yet there are thousands of people who are doing bongo dancing, uh, cowboy poetry, getting spoken word poetry. Um, so Carlton's addressed that, and I just want to say there are people who can help do that for the next survey. Thank you. Oh, and there are the NEA National Heritage Fellows who are masters of traditional arts, so. Uh, I'm going to call on the chairman next. <laughs> Since I fear. I Yes, you get to cut the queue. I, I get certain privileges of being the chairman and also by not being an expert in anything or representing any particular group, I can, I can ask some general questions. Um, it seems to me there, there are two possible uh, conclusions that can be drawn, and I want to try to relate them to each other with a, with a question for, for everyone here. One conclusion, and I, and I think this is something that people don't want to deal with, but I think it's a question that has to be asked which is we're seeing two things at the same time. We're seeing a decline in participation um, in, in the arts by people, people attending um, events. At the same time, we've seen, and, and this is, I think, clear to everyone, a dramatic increase in the number of, of organizations and institutions that present these events. There is a very odd disconnect in that uh, in that thing. When I, when I grew up in St. Louis, there was one theater. When I went back a, a couple of weeks ago, there were uh, close to 30 permanent, uh, permanent institutions. Yet the attendance rate is declining. That leads to a possible conclusion are, or question, are we overbuilt? Are there too many institutions? Too many institutions that are being supported or, or, or kept alive when that maybe shouldn't be the best strategy? The other conclusion, which has been you know, readily engaged already, is whether the um, access to, to art is happening more and more in, in, in um, electronic digital media, new forms, uh, non-traditional ways. Uh, if that's the case, it seems to me both, uh, both conclusions lead to the same question, which is, are we do we need to focus so much on institutions and their buildings, their, 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 their physical locations with these structures to which a tremendous amount of, of, of um, money and, 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 and effort is, is, is invested, or whether we're entering a, a kind of new era where the art and the artistic experience is not as tied to this institutional place, this, 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 this building, and whether there's ways to, to bring it out of that to more places and, and in more, um, more diverse forms. Does that make any sense? Another challenge. <laughs> we're, building, we're building challenges here in this conversation. Uh, Carolyn, are you picking up the forest of cards that's up here? And you have them in a queue? Yes. Okay, so, so who's next? Um, Osmond. Yes, I'm Lynn Osmond, and uh, I'm also the founding chair of a newly founded organization called the Association of Architecture Organizations. And I would agree with what Carlton and Helen said. In fact, are we measuring the right groups in the country? Because I think there is, in fact, growth in the arts, but we're looking at new institutions. The reason we started the Association of Architecture Organizations, which just recently had their first conference that was funded by the NEA, is because of the amazing growth and interest in the area of architecture and design. And so we are, in fact, growing in that area. We had over 150 organizations represented at our, our recent conference because of the interest in the built environment, in the arts, architecture, and design fields. So I think there is an area that we want to look at with some of the new, I wouldn't say architecture's new, but perhaps new interest levels. One of the things with the Chicago Architecture Foundation we find is that we actually are interacting increasing numbers of young men between the ages of 25 and 34. That is not an audience that any of you are probably attracting in here, except perhaps the new media audience. And so there is a growth, but it's in new areas. Thank you. Um, who? Oh, Linda. I'm Linda Downs, um, Executive Director of the College Art Association. Um, uh, Rocco, you were beginning to um, address part of the question that I had in terms of um, how will this influence uh, policy at the NEA and beyond, and what has happened in terms of the surveys in the past, 
um, in, in terms of not only arts uh, policy at the NEA, but um, I noticed there was a footnote in your report uh, that the next survey would include not only level of general education, but also, may, maybe I misread it, but um, uh, education in the arts and the correlation between education and the arts and, yeah, in the next report. So I'm, I'm wondering how this spreads into other um, government agencies, the Department of Education, um, you know, other areas that could have influence as well. So Neil, you want to take that question with our partnership? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is why it's, uh, you know, this is, many of you have seen, some of you have seen reports we've issued from the NEA in the past, and this is why it's so important to have you all around the table and actually share it and discuss and talk about next steps. Um, we typically go around sharing the reports with all of, you know, many of our partners, uh, including arts and cultural organizations, of course, but even federal partners, federal agency partners, where we can think the findings can be of some use for going forward together. I think it's, it's a no-brainer that the one arts learning will be something we will definitely want to work very closely with groups like the Arts Education Partnership and uh, Department of Education and, and, of course, sharing those findings and talking about what are some missed opportunities uh, through, you know, some of the data. Um, so, so it is typically up to the chairman and the and, and, and chairman's office, and of course, um, you know, our office in terms of coordinating a strategy for uh, sharing the data with the public and moving forward. Thank you. So, since both since the chairman's office is here in force, all of us, if you have suggestions for us about places we need to take this these findings and make them operational, we would appreciate it. Uh, but we do partner with the Department of Education. Who's next? Please. Good morning. Um, Deborah Hansen from Del the Department of Education in Delaware and the State Education Agency Directors. Um, actually, this is a great caveat because my question had to do with public education. I, like Helen, am very intrigued by that 18 to 24 uh, age demographics, and I'm curious to know if that demographic was broken out by um, experiences in public, private, parochial, or community enrichment kinds of supplemental services in arts education? No, it's actually a, uh, it's more of a generic category in terms of arts classes or lessons. And then we do ask about specifically not, for, not an outside school as well. So, so, but there's nothing really that gets at the type or quality or curriculum, for example, or what those programs are. It, it may be um, something we could, you know, might look, be looked at in the next report. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't um, make this announcement. The state directors just this morning released a press release um, indicating that the chief council, the, the council of chief state school officers, uh, just endorsed um, the collection of uh, data at the state and national level for non-assessed content areas. That means for the very first time we're going to begin to um, develop longitudinal data systems in the arts, world languages, social studies, health and physical education, to um, be able to look at programs at the student level, at the teacher level, and at the course level. So for the very first time that, that is going to happen and we're really pleased about that. If you're interested in that press release, I would direct you to the CDAY website www.seadae.org, and we would encourage you to use that if it's, if it's useful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ann Meyer Baker from Chorus America. Two questions, I think, for Sunil. The first is I'm curious about the bundle that's called classical music being orchestras, choruses, and chamber music ensembles. So from the choral field, that feels like a bit of a straitjacket for us. And the second is um, around the popularity of choral singing, and we're particularly interested in the correlation between attendance and participation. And does the endowment have a plan to study that more deeply? Sure. Uh, can you repeat the second part of your question? I can answer the first one first. Uh, um, given the popularity yeah. in choral singing, we're particularly interested in understanding more deeply oh, how I that's see. connected to yes, attendance. Yes, great. Okay. So the first, uh, we actually... Um, 
Yes, historically, since time immemorial in the SPPA, which is really 1982 when the world began with the SPPA, uh, we see that choral uh, singing actually was, has been lumped with these other classical music forms when we ask about attendance, as you say. Uh, I don't know the initial rationale for that. I think it had something to do with sample sizes. One thing we have to stress here is working even with a great partner like the census, I hope they're watching this, uh, you know, it's really difficult to, you know, we're constrained in the number of questions we can ask because of the time budgets. Uh, you know, we have like a 10 minute block in the survey to ask all the questions we want to ask. So what we need to do when we come together for the next iteration is determine which questions are really premium and would we need to maybe carve out, for example, a choral singing question independently for, I'm sorry, choral attendance. So we, that's certainly in the cards and on the table to talk about that. Um, the other question, uh, we actually are doing that. We're linking up creation and performance as it relates to participation. And as you saw, young adults are participating more through some of this creation activity. So uh, we were actually have a study underway that's wor being worked on right now to do that for us. Thank you, Sunil. So I see eight cards up. And those eight cards are between us and lunch. So let's take those eight cards and don't anybody put another card up and then we'll break and somebody will explain to us where we get lunch and then we'll come back and talk some more. So uh, Carolyn and Nicole, what's the next card? Sandra. Thank you. I'm sorry to be between people and lunch. Uh, and I'm, I'm just coming at this from the land of where we build lots of facilities and we keep building them. And I, I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm interested in this supply and demand question and the ways that the endowment can ha help us to understand the why. We've been doing a lot of work on campuses in the last five years and um, we're noting that as we map some of the campuses and where students and faculty think of the creative zones, they are none of the, the established creative cultural and arts places that we would designate. None uh, showed up at Vanderbilt in various places. So that's one uh, set of circumstances. And we know that the culture of, of living has changed and we're still building venues on an old sort of 60s urban renewal framework. So I'm really interested in the ways that we can probe a little bit deeper and look at these whys and look at these uh, questions a little bit more closely. I'm also wondering, because we, we have the happy circumstance of working with you on the Performing Arts Festival study, and I want to thank you for that, but we're doing some case studies with that. And I'm just wondering about, uh, you've broken out regional uh, differences, but to get deeper and to get at some of the things that Carlton and Lynn and others have mentioned, what about some accompanying case studies and some ways to focus in and look at the complexion of these things in a much deeper way? Because it is complex and it's shifting. I'm going to take your question as a recommendation because I think it's something we can consider certainly in the, in the future. We are very glad to have that opportunity with the study we're doing on outdoor performing arts festivals to drill down into specific communities and where the real where arts participation is taking place. Um, we will have we hope to have a follow up on fairly soon, hopefully on um, urban and rural and yeah, metropolitan areas uh, captured by the survey. Um, again, some constraints with sample sizes, but we're going to do what we can to get some of the comparisons made. Right. By the way, Sandra Gibson with Arts Presenters. Sorry. <laughs> Next. Joanne. I'm Joanne hubbard Costa from the American Music Center. And in 2008, with the support of the NEA, uh, we commissioned a national study of composers and new music activity uh, called Taking Note. And one of the things that resonated in that, one of many in that study, was the blurring of stylistic boundaries. Um, Pace, Jesse, but the terms classical and jazz are increasingly problematic terms for the living composers and creators of music. When we ask them what kind of music they wrote, they might say they wrote experimental, electrical, acoustic, concert, club, don't try to categorize me. My music <laughs> is influenced by South Asian music and hip hop. So uh, I, I, when I read the study, I, I thought that the categories named were too few to actually measure the participation in artful music. And so I recommend that you work with us to come up with some terminology which will be more inclusive and capture more. Thank you. Next, who is next? Maria de Leon from the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. And I just want to uh, 
ask something that you don't have to answer now, but just ask about the, the demographic diversity of the survey participants and to say that as the endowment begins to develop the next survey, we ask that the issue of diversity move from conversation to practice and increase the participants of the Latino community and other communities of color in this survey, not as different groups of Americans, but as part of what a significant part of American culture is today. Sunil? Yes, uh, so the sample, the, the framework for the survey is, way, is weighted to be nationally representative and these are households where geographic, where, where they've basically been picked in advance for composing uh, the characteristics of the U.S. population at large. Uh, that said, um, you know, I'd like to see, I, I do wonder, you know, with the emergence of the Latin salsa music, just as one happens to be an example here, that where we see that, you know, higher, we suddenly got a whole group of Americans where we might not have seen them in some of these other categories at such high rates. Um, so that's something, you know, we need to keep be cognizant of as we do this. I'll also add um, that I know Paul Terry's here is that disability is, I, I know that I'm always frustrated we don't have large enough numbers, samples of people with disabilities in our surveys. And so that's another population I think we need to be mindful of in terms of getting report, accurate reporting. Thanks. Who do we have? Jean? Hi, Jean Cook, Future of Music Coalition. Um, two observations um, that I'm interested in hearing how the endowment will react to these trends that we're observing, and one of them is reinforcing uh, Joanne's comment about how genres are becoming less and less relevant, um, not only from the creator's side, but I would also say from the side of the person who's actually consuming. Um, and so, as a simple illustration, just the idea that this digital environment has allowed on an iPod, for example, for Ravel to be right next to Radiohead, that people may be consuming, say, classical music, but may not consider it classical music. In the live environment, we also have examples of people like the cellist Matt Hamovitz performing in pizza parlors. Is that getting measured? If people go and see someone playing cello in a pizza parlor, do they consider that a classical performance? So simply to recognize the limitations of working within these categories. And I also understand that you do have a time limitation when you're talking with people and that you only have 10 minutes to ask all of those very important questions. That simply one way to address this might be to say other. You know, if you're saying, do you see Latin music? Do you see classical music? Do you see jazz? Do you see anything else? That would be one way to measure it. The other trend that I was noticing, um, especially around your new questions, um, that lump in broadcast and uh, internet and media all into one category. Um, again, I recognize why that is the case that that happens, but I would like to put forward. Um, in our observations, there is a lot of attention that's paid to new media, um, especially how the internet has transformed the marketplace. And I think that people often forget that radio is still the number one way that most people are consuming at least music and that it might be valuable, um, especially considering the Knight Foundation study from about, I don't know, it was like maybe eight years ago that identified that radio was the primary way that most communities were consuming orchestral classical music, for example, that you would be able to build on that by breaking out radio from other kinds of media. Thank you. Who's next? Hi, Jeffrey Levendorf from the Council of Literary Magazines and Presses and Small Press Distribution. Uh, the two organizations I'm here representing uh, serve the community of independent literary publishers, about a thousand uh, mostly small, very small organizations. So I want to put out a caveat and then perhaps another challenge. And the caveat is this, um, you know, we provide technical assistance and as much as we are here to help these small organizations uh, maintain what they do and grow, we also exist to help them stay small. So I just want to put the caveat out there that um, much of the good of what we accomplish can cannot be quantified uh, by audience numbers, that these publishers exist because they are there in contrast to the large mainstream commercial publishing community, which all does, does, does important work uh, and of course reaches the largest numbers of people but 
Also, it does not reach many people, culturally specific communities, entire genres. We could talk about poetry would not exist in this country without independent literary publishing, for example. And so the uh, numbers alone, um, I just want to put that out there, you know, don't measure the depth of experience and how neglected communities are reached through the arts. Um, and then the, um, the challenge, I guess, um, mirroring what, what Helen said in new media, I think for the next iteration of the survey, we, we may have to think hard about redefining what culture means uh, for a survey such as this. For example, even in terms of the narrow field of publishing, uh, you know, making words public, perhaps right now every blogger is a publisher. So people are participating in, again, this idea of amateur in a positive sense in ways that we could not comprehend uh, when the survey started. And that's a different kind of participation, a very powerful one. Um, similarly, in terms of reading, which I like to think of as a group activity accomplished one person at a time, and a frequently a trans-regional activity, it's generally not regional. Um, for example, even looking at regional things, bookstores, um, commercial bookstores, as a way to market books, have put together a lot of reading groups. More people than ever are engaging in reading groups. That's a fantastic thing. But these sort of things are being missed. So uh, just one last thing also, that the categories for literature strike me as categories taken from the commercial sector. And I don't think they reflect the not-for-profit publishing sector in a, in a meaningful way. And again, uh, this art form in particular, along with a few others here, exists in a funny uh, way in that it reaches people through the commercial marketplace, even though it is a non-commercial activity. Thank you. Could you just comment on what categories you would like to see added that aren't there? Um, I'm not staring at it right now, but for example, it starts off with thriller, mystery, largely what people think of as commercial. The not-for-profit community is not largely producing mysteries, for example. And I don't think that's a fault of us. I mean, this would suggest that the public wants more mysteries. We should produce more mysteries, when in fact, we produce what we do because the commercial sector already provides mysteries. There's one example. No, I'm asking if there were categories that were missing from the list that you think should be added. I'm sh I, I would love to provide them. I, I would need to look at it a little closer. Good, yeah. thank But I think you. even the order of the way that they're listed comes from a commercial skewing of what people might be reading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Bird, uh, formerly, as I said, of uh, Independent Filmmaker Project. Uh, four quick things. Um, I think it's really important the absence of independent film uh, in this survey. And I think that, you know, from 1982 when the survey began until today, that is probably, I think that your skew would be completely different in terms of seeing this decrease if you had included independent film. Um, I've been on the Media Arts panel probably five times, and just the number of festivals and organizations supported, it's huge. Um, so that's just one thing. Um, I really responded to, or the things that Carlton said really resonated with me in terms of this, because this is something that independent filmmakers grapple with all the time, this idea of the officially sanctioned arts and independent film being kind of a sad um, but bastard child of the arts that nobody really appreciates, so it gets overlooked in, in things like this. Um, but also the idea of um, sanctioned institutions. So this conversation about um, the build-up of organizations and do we need more brick-and-mortar type places to screen work? I personally don't think we do. I think that there are probably other new ways, new delivery mechanisms, which are going to be really important for the NEA um, to look at. So whether it's online, whether it's video on demand, whatever it is, um, I think that's important. And then I think just in terms of, I mean, I think this seems like it probably resonates for many art forms here, this huge expanse between the not-for-profit sector and the, the commercial sector. And I think these lines are very, very, very blurred across many art forms. And I think what you were saying about hip-hop or what I just heard um, from colleagues over here about music, it's exactly correct. Um, and when you think about the simple thing of an I, you know, looking at your iPhone and how you listen, have you, how you have your playlists, you don't, as a um, person consuming the arts, you don't make those kinds of categorizations. You just consume. And I think that that is, and so commercial, non-commercial, these things are all sitting side by side. So I think some rules or guidelines about um, the NEA's position about these things might be helpful next go around. Thank you. And who has, oh, we have one more? Yes. 
So a moment ago there were eight people between you and lunch. Now there's only one, so I'll be brief. But uh, first, I'm Ron Bogle. I'm president of the American Architectural Foundation. And I want to thank the NEA for putting together a study that shows real integrity and, uh, and willingness to deal with tough issues. And it was a pleasure and an honor to read it and be included today in this conversation. I also want to thank the NEA for including the design discipline as an equal partner in your programs. Uh, uh, and uh, we were sp specifically in, uh, interested in your issue or your question about visitation to parks, historic sites, monuments, and neighborhoods. It implies an interest in architecture and design and the built environment. And if there's a possibility of us drilling down on that uh, point uh, uh, to understand it more fully, I think that would be beneficial for us. It has been said that architecture is the unavoidable art. Um, so we would love to see uh, an, an additional, more direct question in the survey about design and the built environment and the impact on our lives. Uh, participation with architecture, landscape, the built environment would probably come in at 100% since that's where we spend all of our time. I think because of the, uh, un the uh, unmeasurable impact that architecture and design has on our civic life and culture, our question uh, is how do we create a more informed culture, a more informed citizen citizenry around the importance of architecture and design. Our question uh, currently at the AAF is how do we present architecture uh, as an art? Uh, if you live in Chicago, you go to the Chicago Architecture Foundation and you have a rich array of opportunities available to you to understand architecture, uh, but how do residents of Washington or Waco uh, uh, have access to that same experience? So working with our partners, and we hope the NEA, AAF will be studying the question of how do we present architecture more effectively to the public to help uh, create a greater understanding and appreciation for the role that architecture plays in shaping our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what are the rules and guidelines for lunch? Who, who it's knows? in the back. It's in the back? Yeah. So uh, we're going to take, um, so it's we back can, there? It's back here. Oh, it's back here? Apparently, yes. Oh, it's where they came in. Oh, good. It's oh, even it's better. Where you, oh, it's where you came in. Yeah. Well, we're not all going to fit. How are we gonna, um, so uh, we'll take a break, bring your lunch back, and then we will talk some more. We're scheduled to go until 2. Uh, also, the restrooms are just across the, the lobby. There, if you cut around, you'll see them on the other side. Okay, so by my count, the left side of the room, therefore the left side of my brain, has been more vocal than the right side of the room. So I think we need to punt over to the right side of the brain. Sandra, but uh, we'd like to continue with with additional questions for Sunil, additional advice to the endowment for areas where we can make this survey um, just much more useful to you. Uh, what kind of questions do you think we ought to be adding? And what kind of responses do you think are going to be, this is our chance to learn from you about the fields. So we're also very interested uh, in your thoughts about how your fields might respond to the findings in this survey. Uh, we know that there's a lot of stuff underway right now because, after all, a lot of this is not new news. So we're interested in hearing the, the more recent innovations coming from uh, the arts field as well as questions for us so that the next time this survey comes out, it can be even more helpful to you. So with that, and I see uh, the right side is dominating after lunch. So uh, if we're ready, Nicole and... Carolyn, do you have a cue? Okay. Uh, Joan, I also have to say again that we're being recorded as webcast, I believe. So um, just to keep that in mind, this is a comment that all your comments will be webcast. Thank you. Ron Jones, the International Council of Fine Arts Deans, and obviously I represent a, a, a group of people that are keenly concerned with actually two sides of the conversation, preserving the past and at the same time opening doors into new technologies and opportunities, especially for, for artists. So I, I want to, uh, on behalf of all of the members uh, of, uh, that are in the arts and higher education, I'd really like to, to um, both indicate the appreciation that we have for this uh, study and the data that's come out, 
uh, and I want to put an emphasis on the second part of this sentence, which is what are we going to do with it? Uh, because uh, I, I know there's interest in how to fine tune this for the next survey, but there's some pretty alarming things if you accept the, the data at face value, very alarming things, and, and we are very, very aware of this on university campuses because we're seeing, we're seeing students kind of move away from, in terms of their attendance patterns, uh, and they're moving away and going toward other things, and the arts are not accommodating that other direction quickly enough. And uh, there's got to be solutions for that, and I, I, uh, I guess I'll make a, an appeal to the NEA to help us to find ways to do that, because those are the next generation of educated people that will turn to or turn away from traditional and new art forms. I'm Mike Blakesley with MENC, we're the National Association for Music Education. I have two, well, a, a question and a comment about some correlations. The first is I was interested to see, but not surprised, unfortunately, to see the uh, statistic on the decline of arts education and your uh, I guess comment, not really conclusion, that that could be one of the causal factors in some of this decline. And I guess my question on there is, do you have rich enough data to be able to drill down and see if declines or lack of provision of music education correlates at all with the regional discrepancies in arts performance, attendance, and consumption? That's uh, one of my dream projects, but I, um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have, I mean, the Department of Education obviously has great data on a lot of things, right. but because of the nature and the evolving nature of arts education and, and state-driven, uh, you know, uh, policies mm -hmm. having to do with arts education, uh, we don't right now have a very good historical grasp re in research terms that can we can use as a correlate to, you know, what we're seeing in the survey data in terms of people taking fewer having opportunity or taking fewer classes. Um, but there are, that is something we are still exploring and um, it really, it's a study that's, again, we have, as I said, there are a series, there are three to five, stu five studies underway that are related to the survey already. And one of them is specifically looking to see what the best possible correlator surrogate marker might be for understanding that trend. Yeah, and I wonder if maybe you'll be able to use the FRSS data when it comes yes, out. Yes, and, and I mean, I don't know if we'll be able to use it for this, but I know that I'm, I'm eagerly look, waiting for that. Okay, and my second suggestion to do with a different kind of correlation, and that gets back to the idea that genres in all the arts, I know in music, are so many and shifting so quickly that uh, you might want to actually look at larger classifications mm -hmm. that are less restrictive, but also I wonder if you're able to or if you've looked at correlating your data with the data that are available through the uh, distribution, sales, downloads, consumption of different categories of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's uh, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, yeah. all those people, for very real commercial reasons, track this very closely. Yeah, and that's actually, that's a, a ray of light. I mean, we hope to be able to do that with, um, for example, um, you know, with the reading study we did, some of you might be familiar, uh, you know, there's this report called To Read or Not to Read, where we went very extensively looking at all kinds of other indicators from the sector, publishing, uh, book buying, all kinds of things, and some of the new online reading uh, statistics, not in our survey, and linked it to what we knew through our survey. So I think there's a possibility, and I know what Jesse had done with, uh, you know, what the League of American Orchestras has done is look at, you know, a commercial database, essentially, and relate it to our survey data. So there are other ways of bridging some of these databases, and I hope we can, um, that's, that's, that's definitely high on our list in understanding the contextual uh, you know, framework of what's going on. Andrea Snyder, Dance USA, um, and I want to thank you very much for this meeting. I actually think this is pretty groundbreaking. Uh, I don't believe that we've ever had an interactive conversation together about results coming from out from the Arts Endowment. So um, this is pretty extraordinary. So thank you for that. Um, sort of on the meta view, um, a couple of things that you're probably picking up that I'm hearing is that. Uh, while uh, there's a respect for the NEA to sort of track things consistently over time, 
it's going to be rather challenging to figure out how we move the, the survey and look at a 20th century cultural environment with a 21st century cultural environment with 20th century information and data and survey tools. So uh, we, we, I'm sure we're all very eager to work with you to figure out how to change that because there's definitely a need for a change. Um, and also, I don't know if it's possible, but when we, when we talk about the arts, over time we talk about the loss of arts education as a, in correlation to the impact and usefulness of the arts. And I wonder if there's a way to um, assess back in the 1992 and 2002, 1982, what was the correlation to arts education then versus what, is it, what it is now? Because I think we have a case to make, a strong case to make, that if we can increase arts education, we will indeed hopefully increase arts participation. So I, I'm just trying to hope we can do that. Um, specifically on the dance front, um, <clears throat> I know that we've worked really hard in the Dance USA community to get the word other out. Um, and, it's, and it's very specific to our community. So I would love to work far, more deeply with you to look at how we identify dance and not use the term or pejorative term of other. Um, we have to go into that and figure that one out. Um, and finally, um, oh, two things. In terms of festivals and outdoor festivals, as we're beginning to look at festivals, is there a way to actually um, 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 do a deeper dive in terms of genres and styles and forms that are actually on the stages of those festivals so that we can actually begin to parse out where, what's, being, what's being performed where and by whom? Um, and my final point is um, the benchmarking activity only includes ballet, and not all dance forms, yet according to the current and previous SPPAs, dance forms other than ballet are viewed by nearly twice as many individuals. So I think we're missing the mark on something there, and I'd hope that we can make some change to uh, investigate that further. Thank you. Just to respond one of the points, uh, the dance other than ballet, um, the question, as you stated, is, is phrased like this. Did you... Uh, go to a live dance performance other than ballet, such as modern, folk, tap, or Broadway style during the last 12 months. Um, one thing there is we do have that data from 92, uh, but not from 82. And the report will, will talk, if you, you know, the tables show that unfortunately there too, there were declines from 92 to 08. But your larger point about getting at other kinds of dance is something, you know, again, gets back to prioritizing research questions, which we desperately need to do as we're finding so many new opportunities to mold the survey in a different way. Um, there was some other point about uh, you raised that I was one trying to, is that I, no, festivals, right. So we are, in fact, um, with a study of outdoor performing arts festivals, um, we are, in, uh, we have a national survey. We're happy that uh, the Association of Performing Arts Presenters is able to help us, was able to help us with that, um, as well as um, a, a series of um, case studies where we are going into specific communities and doing site visits, interviews. Unfortunately, I personally won't be at the interview at the site visits. I'd love to see a lot of this myself um, and capture in a more granular way you know, what's going on in those communities. And then our survey itself will kind of give us some statistics about the types of activities that are going on that are captured according to the checklists. Thank you. Uh, Carl Strickland again. Uh, I was, you're talking about ways to stimulate more research that could be useful for NEA. And I'm thinking creativity is such a hot topic in academia now in all kinds of fields. And I'm wondering, you have this great set of federal partners. And I think even NSF now is funding studies, a lot, a lot of it through psychology, but, but I think some other fields on what, what does creativity consist of and how do you stimulate it and so on. So picking up on the references that you had uh, about the kind of case studies or uh, deeper samples you want to do. It seems to me that uh, NEH, um, again, NSF and so forth, uh, if you, if there, there can be a kind of stimulating effect here to say, here we've got this baseline data that's global and macro, but it suggests some interesting correlations of income, education, uh, prior arts education, religious participation, and what we need are uh, very finely done case studies that control for those. So independent of income and education, does religious participation make a difference or prior ed arts education? Uh, so I think there's a, I mean, there's a, a lot of work that's been done, but 
but I think it's been often on, you might say, the micro level about you know, individuals and small groups, what makes them creative. But uh, I think there are sociology, particularly, is getting into this sort of the kind of questions that it seems that your survey does suggest. So I, I was hoping, I think NEA can really play a, a big role stimulating people to do work in a lot of other sectors, and some people can do your work for you in that sense. Thank you. And I don't need to respond to every point, but I did want to in this case, because I'm salivating as you're talking, not just for my lunch. Uh, I mean, I think what you're saying is uh, very interesting in terms of this. We, we know that, like, we've in fact, uh, Sarah Cunningham here, who is with us, our Director of Arts Education, we've had conversations with, for example, National Science Foundation, other groups, that we, we're becoming aware of some of this, these pockets of really exciting research that's going on and how do we connect it back to our own results and at least paint a portrait. One thing I just want to say is there are two, there might, it might be possible to kind of think about this as two conversations. One is what is, what do we need to do to update this survey and what new study to set a new baseline, what do we need to be doing uh, in terms of a design for a new study? Uh, because um, that, you know, the case study approach is very appealing for a variety of ways and I think that is a chance to really go to town and ask a lot of questions that we were desperate to ask and we can't get, get at through a general population survey where you have to word the questions, not only to keep them consistent with previous years, but you have to basically, they have to be intelligible on a phone conversation to people from a variety of backgrounds and even you know, independent film, for example. Uh, I remember when, we were, when I came into the NEA, we were just then designing the survey or updating the survey. And first, one of the first questions I asked was, what about independent film? And I was told at the time, and now, my now, I might challenge it now, but at the time I was a little green, and I, I basically, you know, some of the wording issues with something like independent film, actually the general population, if you just simply ask them in a two-second question, what is do you go to independent film, they don't necessarily relate to it. So we have to have more intelligent and intelligible phrasing for that question. And so, you know, I think the case study gives us a lot of great opportunities to do that. Janet rice Elman, Association of Children's Museums. Um, from the museum community perspective, we certainly want to acknowledge that museums go, go far beyond art museums and art galleries. And so you're missing a large proportion of the museum community um, from the survey. Certainly within my domain of children's museums, we have seen attendance increasing, and that's a good thing and something that we would want to document. And I would also want to comment just that a portion of the survey that um, relates to parents of children. Um, first, the age range is very school-based, so you're not asking about younger children. Um, we know that love for the arts really begins at a very, very, very young age, and so I would encourage you to be thinking about the age ranges that you're asking about. Um, it is important to focus on what's happening with arts education in the schools, but um, it's, it's also very important to find out what's going on at home because parents really set the stage for that lifelong love of creativity and the arts. Uh, Gay Hanno with the National Center for Creative Aging, affiliated with George Washington University. Uh, our center is dedicated to promoting creative expression as part of healthy aging. And I'm heartened by the demographics and would like to just speak uh, with a little more depth in terms of what the next half of the century looks like in terms of the sea change. In t and next year, there will be more people over 65 than under 20. The fastest percentage of our population growing are people over 85. When we see the audiences graying in terms of attendance, we see participation in the arts growing because of more time, encore careers. I just heard from my colleague, uh, Randy Cohen, that four-star generals are actually embracing a future that they have never had in terms of participating in the arts. So uh, we see the supply is not our challenge. We see demand, but we lack infrastructure. <laughs> Many of my associates on the aging service side, social service, health, and broader education are not aware of all of the resources, especially those that sit in this room. So we would ask the NEA for help in terms of bringing, bridging partnerships. We don't believe this requires doing anything new. 
In fact, in arts education, we would ask that you look towards lifelong learning. I know I just talked to my colleague from William & Mary. He has 3,000 new students in his continuing education program. I hear that's true across the country. We have a chance as the arts industry to really embrace this time and look at it as a time of unprecedented resources that by 2030 will change. There will be baby boomers entering their 80s. There will be only half the number of public school teachers at this time that are projected and double the amount of caregivers. And these caregivers will come from in immigrant countries, Africa, Caribbean, and, and South America. How will our country look and what will the arts be doing at this time mid-century? So I, I would ask for the long view as well as uh, using the resources that are so uniquely at hand at this time. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Janet Landay. I'm the director of the Association of Art Museum Directors, and I'm happy to represent the right side of the room. <coughs> um, I had two thoughts about uh, how to make this uh, study more useful. One is a huge challenge, and, and yeah, something you may well have been thinking about, which is the fact that many of our organizations do our own data gathering already and continuously, and if they're like my organization, uh, not nearly as well as we'd like to be doing it. Uh, is there some way that the NEA could get behind planning how to collate this information and how to standardize it, uh, how to build one study from the next? That would be an incredible help. Um, the other, I think, is easier to do, which is uh, in terms of how to use this information, I'm thinking for the art museums that are in my organization, we're talking about what's the impact of this kind of information on our own planning. Perhaps the NEA could convene some smaller meetings of within disciplines to meet with you who's been, plan who's been doing the research and say, well, what are the implications for our organizations, and then perhaps have the NEA create some grant categories to help us figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just was going to say, uh, Janet, thank you very much for the comments because um, I should acknowledge, Janet, because your association actually helped share some of the data, your membership data, with us when we were doing the research, and we realized how, what a challenge it is to indeed standardize those uh, data to, to report them in, in relation to other data sets. So, you know, I think that's an area we would love to t play a role in, and, and I, I have to leave it kind of open for now, but we should, we should certainly follow up on the untapped resource of these membership, membership data across service organizations. Uh, Shannon Dow with Westaf. Um, one of the areas that uh, isn't covered in here that I think would be really useful is for all of those that do not participate in the arts. Uh, and, you know, what is culture to them? Uh, what are their attitudes about arts and culture? Uh, and understanding their obvious limitations, but this, working with the census, you get a cohort of people that are off the radar of the arts. Um, at West Staff, we like to joke that we want to just camp out outside Walmart and see what these people are thinking about the arts, but this would probably be a little bit, bit more methodologically sound. <coughs> That's, yeah, that's, that's actually something which never, hardly ever comes up, if you'll notice in our results, which I'm sure all of you want to know. Who is the non-attendee? You know, I showed you what is the average, what does the attendee look like, you know, in terms of, that was just kind of a, admittedly somewhat superficial way of showing, you know, what, it, what the main characteristics were of the audiences for those art forms. But it would be nice to look at the flip side, what is the non-attendee side? And I think we're going to, you know, this is something I think we would need to revise the methodology a bit to capture that more. Um, and we'll have to, again, pursue that. But I, I'll, we'll take another look at the data and see if we can't get the reverse. Um, I would say, I think this happened here in Washington. Um, the guy who was playing, the, who they, the classical musician who was playing in the subway. Oh, Joshua. Yeah, it was, that was here in, in D.C., right? And, and, um, but that makes me think about the art that's happening that goes invisible. 
that, that because it's not happening in the places where we think art's supposed to happen, that we just don't, we just don't see it. You know, and, and uh, my organization, uh, the Network of Ensemble Theaters, our members are small. Like, most of them are operating at budgets of 50000 or less. I mean, they, these are the groups that are, have their day jobs, come home, grab a McDonald's on their way because it's cheap, and then they rehearse. And, and, and their, their work is happening in shopping malls and cultural community centers, under freeways, in work centers. Um, and and so, so as I look at some of these numbers, like, like um, the, the, you know, like people attending a non-play that people are, are mostly 55 to 74, that so belies like my experience uh, that I just, I, I, maybe I'm going to the wrong events or something. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I see, you know, like I'm seeing a lot of people of color I'm seeing a lot of young people, and it makes me, I, I can't help but wonder if they're just not represented in this. And, uh, and so one of the questions I have is, is for, you know, where, where is this happening? You know, like, like you know, people are, see, are saying that they're seeing and, and participating, but, but where, you know, uh, uh, and I, I'm not sure that like, you know, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just keep rambling and there's other people, so, so that's kind of the big question. Thanks. I'm just going to say, I know people are in queue, I believe, but I thought Carlton, some of Carlton's points about the venues and where people are getting at arts might be fruitful if he wants to talk about that. Hi, uh, Amy Fitterer with Opera America, and uh, we would love to thank you for conducting this survey. Um, but we did have um, a couple of comments. Uh, the first is we, were in conversations with Mark Skorka, we were really struck by the fact that really struck by the fact that the ticket sales were down across the board and not just uh, in the performing arts or the visual arts, but that at sporting events and at attendance at movies that the ticket sales were down. And so we were wondering if there is an opportunity here for the NEA to check in with the appropriate representatives in the sports industry and movies to see why is this happening. There seems to be a change in American society um, that maybe we all should be taking a closer look at. Yes. And then um, the second comment that we had was around how you define live performance. Uh, in the opera world, this is something we're struggling with uh, daily because how people are experiencing opera is changing. So right now we know that uh, in the 2008-2009 season, the Metropolitan Opera sold 1.8 million tickets to HD performances in movie theaters. And those were, si were simulcast, and I'm not sure that they're necessarily represented in the survey. Um, and it's something that we're struggling with too, is, is that a live performance or not? And we also know that 27,000 people attended the San Francisco Opera's performance at Giant Stadium this past June. So uh, participation is really drastically changing even in the opera field as well as in American society. Thank you. Uh, Adam Hutler from Fractured Atlas. Um, there's such a, a strong statistical connection um, that's evident from the data between uh, education levels and arts participation. And I'm really just wondering if anybody knows if, if there's ever been any uh, research done um, to look at whether that reflects correlation or, or causation. In other words, does the arts education itself make people more interested or is it simply that the kind of people who are inclined to um, to, to participate, you know, to be highly educated and to go to grad school and all the rest are, are the same kind of people um, who are going to participate in the arts. I can uh, answer a little bit. We, uh, prior research has shown, and in, in our research right now with the data shows this, this, this year's data show it as well, um, our, that education is indeed, uh, when we do regression analyses and look for cause, um, you know, essentially uh, it's the strongest predictor, education level, of arts participation. Uh, barring arts education. <laughs> so those who actually say they took classes or participated in that way uh, are much more likely, even when you control for other factors, to uh, participate in the arts in these other ways. 
Um, that said, it's, it's also interesting, one report we've issued recently is, is looking at um, arts participation and civic engagement. And it turns out that arts participation, on the other hand, when you control for all other factors, is actually the strongest predictor, even in some cases over education level, of people who also engage in community activities and volunteering. Um, I, I was thinking about the chairman's question earlier, the one that made me squirm a lot and maybe other people too about whether or not we got too many organizations. And also was thinking about just what sounds like a general uh, theme from m many of the comments about the structure of the survey which seems so rooted in the period of time that was where the arts were more institutionally based and the measures of participation were more around did you go to live concerts or not. And it feels like we're in a tremendous inflection point and that the serve this iteration of the survey is coming out at a point of tremendous transition and it's in the in this in between spot where it's still living mostly in this older way of looking at things when we're all sensing and feeling that the world is is behaving differently and people are behaving very differently around the arts and that makes me think about the chairman's question which is to say that if we look at supply and demand through our old lens of um, our, you know, w w w what are the levels of participation in live performance? Are they going down? Are they going up? What are the discrete numbers of people attending? Are they going down or up? And we look to that to answer the question, do we have supply and demand in alignment? That may be too narrow a way to be asking the question. And the comment made earlier about the aging population certainly le leads you to a, a whole other way of thinking about supply and demand. The Philadelphia Orchestra uh, through closed circuit uh, sends its concerts into nursing homes throughout the Philadelphia area. So where does that stack up in our measure of arts participation? Again, we have you know, other examples of ways in which uh, people are engaging and participating in the art that don't really fit uh, as comfortably into what our current measures are. So as we consider uh, what's the right number of, of, of organizations to meet demand, we need to consider what are the capacities of organizations to adapt to all of these changes and to meet the demand uh, where it is. And th those would give you, I think, meaningful signs of, of health and uh, relevance and a balanced kind of, of ecology. Jerry Combs, Southern Arts Federation. Um, Sunil, talk to me a little bit about the states where we don't have attendance figures. And I, when I look at this, I uh, at regularly as a regional organization, um, I, we serve nine states. And when I look at the southeast region, four of those states have no figures. So um, in, in using this um, data effectively, um, you know, I've, I've got, I'm, I'm a, unable to, to really pull in all nine states. So is there something we can do to help in the next round or what, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a great uh, idea, uh, point. Uh, with the states that I mentioned, um, and um, the regions I mentioned rather, was it East, South, Central, and West, South, Central, um, we don't have enough, many states in those, represented in those areas for a state by state comparison, but we do have enough data for regional Compar not comparison necessarily, but talking about regional data. What prevents us from making direct comparisons in terms of, you know, say like the region of this is, you know, has much higher rates in terms of percentage than this other region is because of uh, wide uh, confidence intervals, basically. So um, what that means is uh, the states that we know about, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, particularly uh, in that area, uh, we do see low rates for relatively low rates compared to what we're seeing around the country in terms of arts participation uh, as measured by attendance again. But as I said, uh, they come out very strongly in areas like choral singing and uh, there were a couple of other areas I'm not, I can get back to you on that we've, we have in the report and I believe it's in my presentation. Um, so we do know they're, they, in some of the creation and performing activities in fact, uh, the, the rates actually are higher in, in, with respect to some of the other states, uh, even if we're not ranking them strictly, you know, as top 10 or anything like that. So, um, so we need to understand, I think I would just submit to you also, is there, do you see any um, kind of interesting kind of counterbalance or uh, association between creating and performing uh, and on the other hand, attendance 
that's going on in those regions. Uh, we, we don't have the data to show that, you know, what that relationship is precisely at that level, but it's intriguing, certainly. Hi, I'm Jonathan Herman, Executive Director of the National Guild of Community Schools of the Arts, and uh, we're interested in um, promoting and supporting lifelong learning opportunities in the arts. And um, I kind of wanted to, I guess, build on what Jesse was saying, and, you know, the general theme of um, the shifting world and, and the ways that all of our our assumptions and categories and ways of looking at the world um, are changing. And I just want to point out in, in education and in arts learning that, you know, we haven't really talked about it much, all of the same things apply in that, of course, there's all the formal and there's the, the um, challenges we're seeing in K-12 arts education and beyond. Um, but the way that people are learning, uh, developing art skills is clearly changing. And, um, you know, there's we, my particular, you know, we look or through an organizational lens at the range of organizations that are offering those opportunities, whether arts organizations or youth serving organizations or elder care. Um, but also, uh, even this very notion of, of uh, place-based arts learning is, is, is changing, so that we know that the sales of educational materials, of DVDs and videos to learn instruments and learn art skills, um, there's a great rise in those, and of course there's all the online learning opportunities. So I just want to uh, point that out when we start looking at arts learning. You know, you talk about arts uh, lessons and classes, which is clearly very important. And I do applaud the endowment for adding those questions into the survey because those uh, in, in 08, I think it's the first time we saw those. But you know, the, <laughs> the ground continues to shift. Thank you. Are are we out of questions? And comments? <laughs> I'm getting coached by open. Amber Farber, the American Association of Museums. And um, I just wanted to put an even slightly finer point on um, a couple of comments that the Janets have made, <laughs> Janet Landay from AMD and Janet Rice-Elman. Um, to Janet's point about research as a broad museum field, um, we are always looking at ways that we can work in collaboration with the agencies and even help the um, cultural agencies uh, secure even additional funds to, for this purpose of gathering more sound research. I mean, I think all of our organizations feel it across the board. We get increased from reporters. We get increased from all directions about um, where more sound data would be helpful. But to Janet Rice-Elman's point about the extent to which the survey reflects the broad breadth of museums. You know, we did talk a little bit about this earlier and, and both have respect for the fact that it's the National Endowment for the Arts. So certainly um, there's uh, inherent in, in, your, in that mission, there's gonna be um, some portions of the field that aren't as front and center. But I think the point to be made there is that another way to look at that is people's experience with exhibits rather than just going to an institution. And that's just to say we have lots of anecdotal evidence um, in various forms that, you know, um, art exhibits are being brought to medical students to help them improve their reading of medical charts and their bedside manner. And there's a lot of ways that people experience artistic interpretations of our world that might not be captured here. We know of um, fine arts museums and local um, history and science and community museums that are working with students to come up with artistic interpretations of how the Colorado River running through parts of Texas affects the community. So just to, to put an even finer point on that, there's, there's lots of ways to get at that and, and maybe capturing some more of that would be really useful here. Thank you for that suggestion because I think it dovetails a little bit with what uh, Rocco was saying about buildings and infrastructure, you know, exhibits, thinking about distinct experiences viewing exhibits is, is a really a need, really, really neat idea. Um, I would, oh you have, okay, Nicole, Jonathan. Well, I was, um, uh, I was thinking throughout this whole conversation this Jonathan about Jonathan Katz. Jonathan Katz, National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, and I've, I've been thinking about the, um, the chairman's uh, initial response to how many, how many new organizations we have, and 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 the and the increasing failure rate that we see as well, and uh, and so much so much of the data that we've been we've been looking at supports that, and we. Um, I know that, that since, not, since 2004, there are 500 more arts organizations in North Carolina. And, and, they'll, and they'll, be, uh, they'll, they'll be challenged. And we also know that, that, that with all these more organizations, 
and we have declining attendance in the traditional forms, that there's a small percentage of house out there, that, there's, that the audience is spread amongst, amongst many performances and many organizations. Well, what does that suggest to us um, who have to consider questions of public funding? I think several things. Um, one of them is that um, it's, not our, it's not our place to reduce the biodiversity. Right? I mean, there's, there's, if, the, if, the, if the environment is changing, there will be many more kinds of, of organizations emerging and many more failures. That's to be expected, I think. But I think that there is a public purpose in providing people with, with uh, capacity building knowledge so that they can make informed decisions and the ones for which there is a real need get access to the public and the public can respond. So I think, I think that one, one message here is that we invest in capacity building knowledge, probably through service organizations, but in, in, in marketing, in developing, and, and in a number of other things. But I just mentioned that, capacity building knowledge as an, as an area that we're directed towards from the research. Another thing that occurs to me is that distribution is very challenging for a number of not only traditional but, but new art forms. Um, distribution is a major problem for independent film, for independent literature, for all kinds of crafts, for the whole dance field, that's why they have to tour all the time, and, uh, and for chamber music. So there are areas in which, in which the, the, the foundation world and the public sector simply have not looked at adequately. You may, and, and that has to do also with the, with the choices that are available to the audiences. How many distribution companies are there in literature? Maybe four for all the, for all the independent bookstores and all, and, all the, and all the chains that we see. So that the, the, the alternatives that you have, you know, except if you go, um, until you go online, you know, where you're not getting individual advice uh, from, a, from a bookstore, are very limited. But looking at distribution would be something that the research um, directs us to also. Finally, I, I think it's, it's, it's useful to look at the, um, the, ex the endowment could be a leader in research about the arts experience that brings people back. We've had some Wallace investment in this through, through, through RAND. We see in Alan Brown's and Stephen Tepper's research, I think the best in this area so far. But I think the endowments dialogue with the research community can, ha can help us through this, this, this welter of so much, so much happening, so many startups, so many failures. Um, the, um, the, the notion of what, what the, the valuable arts experience is, that is the public benefit is important. Also, um, I think it's important to um, to think about the hierarchy of public purposes that with so, with so much to do and, and, and so many challenges that the research reveals, um, the, the question is, is, is there something that you do that's, that goes across all the art forms and across all the access and across high technology and low technology? And I think there are a couple of yeses. One of them is obviously arts education, whether it's amateur, for-profit or not-for-profit not uh, purveyors the gateway is arts education. Um, and so I think this, that's just a, a couple of things to mention. I know you can't tinker that much with SPPA. It's a longitudinal study. So maybe one of the things we have to do is step back and say, what do we really need to know? And what are the other vehicles we have to learn? So Jonathan, you're suggesting that we start a new study that runs parallel to SPPA that captures some of the questions that have been put on the table by the field. Yes. Um, Jonathan, while your mic is hot, would you comment on how you think the states will respond to this report? That's your constituency. Well, you know, they, it's, the, the, what, the states, what the states typically do is, is take national information and look at it through a, a more local filter. In other words, the, the, the state is a locus of policy making and resource allocation. So one of, the, one of the questions is, do these national trends actually apply in my state? In some cases, they apply very strongly. In some cases, they don't apply very strongly. In some, in some cases, some of, the, some of the participation in these art forms are increasing in the state, where they're not increasing in a, a, you know, nationally. So they, but but we, we do look at this. In fact, we, we've already had a, 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 a web seminar with this information, with, with Sunil leading it. Um, to take a look and to ask some of those questions. So I, I could actually answer you very specifically about, about how state arts agencies are going to use this information. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested to hear from other fields about the, how you're going to present this and share this information with your constituents and what 
next steps in the dialogue you think you're going to set into play? And since, Sandra, your card is up, I, you, you can ask your question, but I'm asking mine. <laughs> Sandra Gibson with Arts Presenters. I was, it just wanted to tag on with what Jonathan said about a new survey. And it, when we start to talk about valuing experiences, one of the things I'd like to see us get at is the disconnect between the public valuing an experience in the arts but disconnected from the artist that created the experience. And that came out in the U.S. Artist Study. And as the lines are blurring increasingly and, and uh, what it takes to be a creator starts to shift, I think it'll be important to look at what's important in that experience and what are people's attitudes about artists, uh, especially if we're looking to really see uh, some change in the support systems for artists in the United States. Um, in terms of our field, um, this particular study uh, we're anxious to share because it, we're all over the map right now with what we're hearing uh, with attendance and participation rates um, as people really look at their pricing and their programming and what they're doing. Uh, we will probably uh, set up, and, and we've, we've gone on the road with Sunil each time the studies come out to statewide consortium meetings, so it's a combination of that. And we're going to be out between February and June at a number of, of uh, statewide presenting consortium meetings and gatherings that we're organizing. And we've been doing a series of um, uh, go-to-meeting phone-ins on issues. And this is one of, you know, increasing participation and the state of participation is one of those topics. So we, we would love to probably have Sunil and others there. And what we typically do in those cases is have members um, talking about their own experience and their own, um, get their input and reflections on a study like this. Could you comment just briefly on any trends that you are seeing coming out of the presenting field? I mean, I was struck by when I came to your board meeting, people talking about the increased appetite and audience for new dance experiences. Yes. That they didn't want to see the same old, same old, but yes. that they actually would come if it was something that they had not heard of had, before. And had never experienced before. That is definitely a trend. And we're, of course, like everyone else, seeing a trend toward uh, much, much, much later decision making. We have a number of organizations that are now working with 60% walk up um, uh, 60 sales. 60% walk up? Walk up sales, yes. Wow. Not single sales, walk up sales. A number of organizations on campuses and in municipalities. So um, it, it's really created a sea change in how people make decisions about programming and what to program. So presenters are leaving holes in their seasons, thinking about things differently. Uh, a number of people, though, are really focusing on how do I have maybe fewer artists come into my community for a longer period of time. And, and many are really focusing on contemporary voices because they are realizing that their communities are interested in things, people, expression they've not experienced before. And what role does social media play in the walk-up? Do you know? Twitter, blah, blah. We, we haven't examined it, but presenters are increasingly using it. Um, uh, and, and hiring people in their operations who are making their marketing departments crazy, um, who organize street teams and get the word out in very different ways. Um, so we don't know what, what's causing. I th we think it's first late decision-making, cost, impact on time, uh, and we haven't looked at whether social in, uh, media is contributing to that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, oh, I see one card up, but I'm going to just uh, ask a separate question. I'd like to invite any of the discipline directors who've been modestly not speaking because we're hearing from the field. But if you want to weigh in on anything, please grab the mic. And I'd also like to invite the speakers. Well, Jesse's come back again, but I'm looking at Carlton after what you've heard to maybe after this next speaker give your response to what you've heard and Helen the same. Okay. I just wanted to respond to your question a minute ago about how this information will be shared. Um, like Jonathan, my constituency are uh, state arts education directors in 46 states. So this has um, a direct impact on their work in K-12 education. And um, as Jonathan said, it, it's policy making and um, you know, how to allocate resources. Um, and it looks very different in each state. Um, through support from the National Endowment for the Arts for this organization, we, we exist in a, in a virtual portal. So um, we, we are not, uh, we're, many of us are experiencing um, 
travel restrictions at State Departments of Education. So that, that is critical that we have this virtual portal, that we, that we exist in, in, in a virtual space. So we um, hold monthly conference calls and professional development online. And Sunil, I would uh, extend that invitation to you because I think this is very valuable information. And in light of what I said this morning about collecting data um, at the State Departments of Education, very timely. So thank you again. Um, on behalf of the State Directors, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Okay. Oh, you have? Yes. Randy. Yes. Hi. Randy Cohn with Americans for the Arts. Um, I would just say congratulations again on the next iteration of the SPPA. It's absolutely the gold standard of uh, public participation uh, research. And um, it's, uh, it's certainly, as Jonathan said, you know, you can't stop doing it. It's something to be augmented, not replaced. So, um, and it's, it's a fabulous piece of work. Uh, and now we just need to figure out how we just adapt that to the changing times. But uh, by no means, please don't say, okay, well, let's, uh, times have changed, let's stop doing it. Um, we uh, represent the nation's 5,000 local arts agencies. They're very interested in these data. We've reported on the preliminary findings already. And, uh, you know, I think um, the data certainly reflect what we find is that, uh, you know, demand is lagging capacity in this country right now. Um, you know, we've talked about the growth of uh, nonprofit arts organizations. You look at the Urban Institute's data, uh, at least as of last year, we've had some closings. Uh, you know, over about 104,000 of them, just to put that growth into some context, between 2003 and 2008, a new nonprofit arts organization created every three hours in this country. So, if any of you funders are feeling like uh, there's more people knocking on the door, there, there probably are. Um, at the local level, certainly with local arts agencies, uh, they're dealing with that issue. The whole nonprofit structure really is in question now. Um, I don't think the problem is that there's too much art in this country, uh, 104,000 nonprofit arts organizations. Maybe we need to look at the whole capacity question. Um, and so we see more arts incubators, uh, more relationships between uh, and partnerships uh, in the community with schools or faith-based institutions that have lots of performing and exhibition space available. Does everything need to be a nonprofit organization? Um, funders have a role in this. You know, should they be thinking about this, you know, and some do fund organizations without the 501c3. So that's the kind of policy churn we're seeing happening uh, at the community level, certainly, and I'm sure at all levels, uh, with these kind of data. Um, so uh, we're very excited about it. Thanks uh, again for this convening also, like Andrea said. Uh, um, I don't remember this big of, I've never remember, I think I've ever been at a table this big. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Joanne? <laughs> Joanne Hubbard-Casa from the American Music Center again. Um, we'll share this with our field of composers, performers, uh, ensembles, uh, educators, and institutions inst interested in new music on our websites, our home website, uh, and also on our, uh, our magazine. I have staff listening to this broadcast right now <laughs> uh, and taking notes. Uh, we'll certainly blog about it. I'm particularly interested in the First of all, I'm very grateful for this conversation, and I'm particularly interested in the uh, opportunities that seem to be surfacing in the intersection between the arts and the rest of life and the rest of civic life. And I think we may contextualize it in that way to help our field begin to explore the chairman's question, how do we use any opportunities to reframe the way the arts work in community because the old institutions aren't going to work anymore? Thank you. Hi, uh, Kathy Evans from the National Alliance for Musical Theater. Um, you were asking how we would disseminate to our field. We would, I, I love how open this meeting is today with the webcast and we will provide links of course to your website. Um, I, I had one question I just wanted to bring up before we end on methodology for the research which was when you added the performing arts festivals category this year I was wondering if you were able to make sure that you weren't losing people who might have described a Shakespeare festival as a non-musical play in 2002 but now they're calling it 
a, a festival experience, and maybe therefore the numbers are higher than you might otherwise see. In uh, and the, oh, sorry. In yeah, we we the questionnaire that was designed so that these questions weren't mutually exclusive, so uh, they weren't asked. You know, they were asked a series of activities whether they'd participated in it. Now we don't know whether in the survey takers' mind they said, "Oh, well, I already answered that about." Performing arts festivals, so I'm not going to bother to say that I went to a non-mixed. You know, we don't know that honestly with the data itself. Um, and so far, you know, the comparisons don't show an untoward kind of spread between you know festivals and uh, you know in terms of the gap between it's festivals it's and theater. It's just such a huge number. Yeah. Want, you know. So for art, for performing arts festivals, right, yeah. Right. And I think again that gets to something again we're hoping to study separately through this festival study, which is access through maybe low cost, discounted. Uh, you know, methods. Uh, we don't know whether just by virtue of being in an open space in a community, are we attracting more types of participation that we would through some of these other types of events. And I guess my, my last point would be, it's such a different world since 1982 that I would, the next time you do the study, I would really start by asking why are we doing this with the same, you know, attributes that we had in 1982. What do we hope to learn by doing this and what else can we add by adding all of the new media questions that came up today. Thank you. Um, I think if you're going to blog and stuff, and I hope you will, we all hope you will, please put National Endowment for the Arts in there somewhere so we find it. <laughs> you're liable to go off on your own, <laughs> and then we won't know what you're saying. <laughs> oh, I see Rocco's hand. Well, I, I've, this is the first one of these that, that uh, I've been privileged to be a part of. I'm fascinated by, by the uh, entire discussion here today. I hope that we can uh, continue this and have more of them, uh, and maybe in, in short order. The, uh, there, there are two different discussions, I think, that are, that are possible. The, the, the one we've been having, it's a legitimate one. Um, it has to do with, with um, our, our methodology and how that could be um, more illuminative, more uh, uh, informative, how it can uh, adjust uh, to serve your needs better, uh, as valuable as it's been. And I think uh, Sunil's very attuned uh, to those adjustments and things we can do to make it better. There is, however, I think a tendency when you um, ask a question and, that, and the answer is a downbeat one to immediately say, well, you've asked the wrong question or you've done, asked the wrong people the wrong questions in the wrong way. And that's mainly what we've had for a couple of hours. Uh, I accept that, and I think that conversation should be continued. But I think there are corollary questions that I think we could get to in, in future discussions. Uh, the one I raised earlier, whether the whole industry is overbuilt, uh, uh, Jonathan's answer is no. Uh, it's an ecosystem. Let a th thousand flowers bloom. Well, one corollary of that is, uh, and this is a discussion that Jesse and I were having at lunch, one corollary of that particular uh, uh, situation is that very few people in the arts can make a living wage. Uh, I know that in my own discipline of the theater, uh, people who work in the resident theaters can't make a living, directors, designers, actors, it's, and so forth. That may be a product of this overbuilt condition that I'm talking about before. I do think that each of you sitting around this table does care deeply about the ability of artists um, to survive and make a living and make a decent living uh, at, 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 what they, at what they do, and by and large, they don't. Would, would it be easier for them if there were fewer institutions, maybe fewer, fewer artists? Uh, I, I don't know, but, but these are, these, you know, the, the median, I think we have a statistic, Sunil, the median um, earnings of an artist is about $35,000. Well, that's disgraceful uh, and unacceptable uh, in, this, uh, in this particular society. So I would hope that um, in future discussions, we can have um, we can address some of the some of the bigger issues that are that are taken up by this, whether the system is overbuilt, whether there's not uh, enough relevance between what's being put on uh, on the stage or in the museums and the and the audience that's uh, that's engaging it, and we have to to change not just the delivery system or the questions we're asking, but actually the the substance of the uh, of the art and the artistic experience itself. These are questions I know for a later date, but they're certainly ones that are occurring to me as we're going along. Thank you, Rocco. Um, oh, yeah, so I'll, I'll respond to that just a little bit. I'll, I'll say that taking economics out of the equation does not, um, does not change the need of people to, need to have art in their lives. 
and for them to, to have an access to affordable and ways to communicate and participate in the arts and a way to stay sane. Um, the arts is a way that people cope with life. It's the way that we communicate. It's the way that we, we view cultural expression is, is our coping mechanism for going through life. And I think a number of institutions and organizations have sprung up um, in the recent times because there's a need, because the larger institutions that have been funded um, in the communities have not served the needs of the, of the vast majority of the people. They've served a particular set. And so serving portions of the population that have traditionally not been served um, you know, and received bulk of the funding, these, a lot of cultural institutions will pop up even though they're serving a very small and very specific dynamic or demographic. So we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about the overbuilding of the, of the, of the system. Um, just a quick story about alternate routes, where I come from. Um, in 1976, there was a small grant written for about five or six thousand dollars to the National Endowment for the Art to convene a group of theater artists in the in the Appalachian Mountains of, of Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Highlander Center for Research and Education. Um, a whole lot of folks came to that meeting, but only a few left with an understanding and a commonality of what they needed to do to continue the work that was needed to be done in their communities. Um, and most of these people don't make a living doing art. They, they, they do art to make their living as far as helping people to cope through and get through the day. Um, alternate routes at this point in our existence now serves artists of all disciplines. We're not just focused on theater. We're almost coming up on 35 years old and our population of the people that founded the organization are still actively engaged and those people are now in their 60s. Um, and we have our median age of our membership is in the mid-20s. Um, so we have a new influx of people that are coming to the organization because there's a need in the community for an organization like Alternate Roots that supports artists that don't get the type of support from the larger institutions um, throughout, throughout the country. So we're very relevant to our field, and that's what makes us you know, continue to grow. Right now we're, we've got more staff people now than we've had uh, ever. Um, in, in the organization, we have our largest membership that I can recount, and I've been involved in the organization for 10 years. We have members not just in the South, but all across the country, as well as internationally in London and Mexico and, and other countries. So I think it's about the relevancy of, of the work that is being done and how that speaks to community is how we should gauge how these organizations are funded and, and, and how we build the capacity. There's a lot of capacity that needs to be happening, capacity building that needs to happen in a lot of communities throughout the, the country, but they're not all in um, metropolitan areas. I live in a small town of about 1,200 people, um, and there's no art center in my community. The only reason that I love jazz is because my father was from Harlem, New York, and he played it for us every Saturday. It was part of, of the institutional cultural training that I came up through. Um, but um, just another example, Jackson, Mississippi, which is the, the capital of Mississippi, doesn't even have a movie theater in the city, a city of 250,000 people. So I think, you know, when we look at a lot of these statistics, we have to think about all of the different pieces that play into how we, how we tabulate this information and how we then go back and, and see how we can make some real changes to affect um, our communities in a way that is, that is going to be looking forward and not always uh, stuck in the present or looking backwards. So Carlton, for those who don't know the work of Alternate Roots, what kind of artists belong? All types of artists. Um, we have uh, musicians, dancers, uh, theater artists, directors, writers, um, media makers, uh, web designers, um, musicians and poets like myself. Um, there's a wealth of, of, of all different type of organizations and, and, and artists that are a part of it. And part of the beauty is that we bring them together and what they do is they, they learn from each other and collaborate and find new ways to, to navigate society um, with their art. So it's a very, very important thing that's happening right now. Thank you. Helen, you want to have any last words? And then we have a couple of cards and then I think we're wrapped. Uh, it just sounds to me like what you're talking about is a new way of, of making a creative, uh, creative economy so that the old ideas about creative economy are totally transforming and people are deprofessionalizing in certain ways and reconstituting the way that they interact with cultural forms that have been transmitted from the past to the future. Absolutely. So that's what I would say, and I would say it sounds like then we become the context providers 
for this new sort of apparently fragmented situation that also, though, is reforming in a way that we are uncertain about at the moment, but that there's a lot of room to make it work as a creative economy. Thank you. Now I see we have the last four cards. So who's first? I think I speak for Ron Jones here that both the uh, fine arts deans that he represents and the arts and sciences deans that I represent, we plan to put this out on our listservs. And there's about 2,000 deans around the country who belong to our organizations. There's about 4 million college students who go to institutions that uh, our, our deans are working at. And we'd like to just get the word out. And in addition, at our annual meeting, which is in November, we, I would like to have a session and if possible have somebody from NEA come. It's in New Orleans, by the way. Um, I'm there. Okay. <laughs> you can have Rocco. Uh, and we're, we're interested in both the way in which we're, how we can make an impact in that we have students who are probably less engaged in the arts than they might have been before, judging from the survey. But then, and so how can we make an impact to actually educate them better and make them citizens in the arts for their lives? But the other way is that, and, is that we're both, Ron and I are both very aware that colleges and universities are nodal points for arts activities. Uh, so lots of senior citizens who had no connection to my college live in Williamsburg because of the arts. And they are friends of the art museum, they go to the theater, they go to music. Uh, they're also sometimes very good donors. Uh, but, but colleges and universities are also by themselves sort of generators of arts activities. So I think we'd like to discuss the survey. We'd like to have somebody from NEA there and, and kind of get a dialogue going amongst our members about how we can use this information to, to affect the way we do arts programming and the way we educate our students. Thank you. Next. I'm Matt Barisi, Association of Writers and Writing Programs. I just wanted to speak briefly to the, the supply and demand narrative because I've heard that for, for a while. And <clears throat> I think you have to be careful because I think what's true in one discipline may not be true in another discipline. And I got my start in the theater in Chicago, and there were 220 theaters there, and we used to joke, there's 220 theaters in Chicago, and every year 217 go out of business. Um, <laughs> So, you know, what's true in one discipline is not true in another. And I see, looking across the literary field, um, that there's a real lack of literary infrastructure that exists for, for, for things like symphonies and, 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 uh, and theaters in the country. And I think capacity building is something, something to think about. You know, speaking to your last point, uh, colleges and universities have really become the literary infrastructure in the country. That's where people go to see readings and, and lectures and things like that. And that doesn't exist. There's not a literary center in every big major city, you know, necessarily. Thank you. I was going to, uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. I was going to make a very similar point about the potential for artist training, um, and and both looking at informal informal ways in which artists are trained to make a living, because I think I think much of our training is about the capacity of artists. But the question is, can they make a living in not-for-profit environments and social service environments and schools and the other places that we're talking about investing in? And can we, can we, can we um, see how informal artists um, are prepared to do that and get their information about the, that capacity as well as artists who come through school systems? The other thing I was going to suggest is, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting to evaluate um, the impact of this discussion to say, to say to everybody around the table, how do you expect you, um, the people that you work with to use this information? How are you going to help them use it? And then in a year, ask us the same question. How did we use it? Was it, was it what we expected? Or did we learn, did we learn something different by that? And, and maybe, should, maybe is there something that we adjust as a result? So we have a learning community that way. When's the next survey? It's uh, to be conducted in 2012, which isn't that far away, actually, in terms of planning. So we've got time, but just enough time to make some major changes. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, as was said before, is not only the budget of the questionnaire in terms of time, but, you know, uh, Jerry, I think you raised the point, you know, just how many states we cover really extensively enough to do state-level reporting uh, is, is a big factor, too, that we want to get at. So we're competing with depth and varying types of questions. Um, so, you know, more and more I hear these great ideas, and I, I wish we were evaluating this in terms of an impact, but I can tell you, as a, you know, we're going to take this, all this feedback very seriously and hopefully work with some of you to talk about future questions. So, Jonathan, I guess we'll have to have an interim impact evaluation dialogue, uh, because we can't wait that long for the next survey. Okay, who has the last word? 
Politary Accessibility Office. Um, in addition to older adults, I just wanted to raise the issue of the 54 million Americans with disabilities around the country. And those numbers are growing, especially as we have many servicemen and women returning from the wars. Um, there are still huge potential audiences and participants for the arts. And I know that some of you around this table have assumed leadership roles in educating your constituents on the importance of accessibility. People with disabilities will not participate in the arts unless they're comfortable. The accommodations are provided and provided in a comfortable venue. In June of this year, President Obama's disability policy person put together a meeting of 20 museums around the country and three federal agencies, including ours, to talk about how to encourage and assist museums in making their programs more accommodating to people, especially with sensory loss. For example, touch tours, audio description, sign interpreted tours, etc., as well as the White House. The performing arts have been more aggressive in this area, I guess because they're selling tickets. I don't know, but, uh, but a lot more still needs to be done in that area. Thank you very much, and I think, um, thank you all. So here's applause for all of you. Thank you for coming to our meeting.